zo direct zullen ze hier binnenstappen. De timide, vreemde natuurkundige Freeman Dyson. De quick-witted, ever-smiling paleontoloog Stephen J. Gould. De vechtlustige, energieke filosoof Daniel C. Dennett. De bedachtzame, bijna dromerige neuroloog Oliver Sacks. De vormelijke, uiterst precies formulerende biochemicus Rupert Sheldrake. En de wellevende wetenschapsfilosoof Stephen Toulmin. Maanden geleden zijn ze uitgenodigd voor wat toen nog heette een poging tot symbiose. Na iedereen afzonderlijk bezocht te hebben, liet ik de hoop op verzoening varen. De tegenstellingen bleken veel dieper dan ik a priori vermoedde. De omschrijving, een poging tot symbiose, werd meer en meer een godspe. Wat zal er gebeuren als de zes, die elkaar wetenschappelijk gezien te vuur en te zwaard bestrijden, zo direct binnenstappen? Dat is een vraag die misschien even intrigerend is als de vraag waarmee een schitterend ongeluk ooit begon. De vraag, wat heeft de wetenschap ons aan het eind van de 20e eeuw eigenlijk gebracht? Kennis of ook begrip? Ik verwacht een pandemonium. Vermoedelijk lukt het ons niet om langer dan vijf minuten beleefd tegen elkaar te blijven, zei Daniel Dennett in Noord en Dover. Het wordt ruzie nog chaos. We bestrijden elkaar in de vakliteratuur op leven en dood, maar tijdens persoonlijke ontmoetingen worden alle conflicten toegedekt, zei Freeman Dyson in Cambridge. Wel nu, het is maandagmorgen rond tien uur. De natuurkundige, de paleontoloog, de twee filosofen, de neuroloog en de biochemicus worden geschminkt om zo direct binnen te stappen. In studio 6. Well, the brain and the mind. Hi, Steve. Steve. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. Hello. Hello, Oliver. Hello. I want to talk to you about Hampstead Heath sometime. I understand our nannies both took us for walks on the same. Oh, right. <laughs> Says something about class background. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I live right next to Hampstead Heath. Yes, yes. 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 you, you were raised there. I, in I played Heath? on Queen's Boulevard. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a tree of you are connected to Hampstead Heath. Terrible, Robert terrible. Sheldrick is living there at the moment. I live there. Yes, and yes, Oliver yes. Sex and Stephen Toulmin were raised there. Yes. <laughs> what kind of memories do you share? The same? Well, we'll find out. <laughs> well. Hmm. It was the landscape of your, your dreams of... As a child, you went to Jolly Julian Huxley to ask about evolution. Uh, yeah, they looked at splendor in the grass and glory in the flower, right? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I remember, remember tobogganing down Parliament Hill fields. I mean, I think the things one remembers about childhood are very often the things that almost never happened. And my, and my most, two most intense memories are memories of winter, which is really quite rare in England. I remember going skating on the Bedford level when in, I think it must have been 36, when it was just like Holland. You had a, a stretch of 30 or 40 kilometers, which was solidly frozen flood water between the dikes, and you could just start skating and feel your, and put your foot over barbed wire fences from time to time, and then go on for another mile, and so on. And there were people with braziers uh, roasting chestnuts on the side of the thing, straight out of a straight out of a Bruegel painting, who you knows? But I'm sure the reason I remember it is just because it only happened once. As you say, it's things which happen only once that you remember. Yes. There was an eclipse of the sun in 1927, which was visible in England, and that I remember vividly. It was. You were within the range of totality, were you? No. 
Yeah. No, it was t total in Yorkshire. And yeah, my, my, father, my parents went up to Yorkshire to see it. I, I stayed home. You, you, you missed it too. Well, anyway, but, but I saw it, it three, three quarters total. And, and I was three at the time. And that, that, uh, I suppose it may have had something to do with my being a scientist. I had an experience a couple of years ago, which led me to write an essay about it, which gave me some insight. It was just a funny little incident I remembered and had remembered all my life, something I used to do with my grandfather weekly in Queens, where I grew up. We would buy the New York Times, and then we'd go. He was a very natally dressed and formal man. We'd go to a bunch to a some steps, and he'd lay out the newspaper, and we'd sit on the steps and have these wonderful conversations. Now, the main building in that area was the Farsals Tennis Stadium, and so I pictured, and I was sure that's where it was, that these steps were the back steps of the tennis stadium. And, and all my life I've told that story. Clearly I knew it to be so. I was in my old neighborhood for the first time in 30 years, a couple of years ago, and I walked down Queens Boulevard, and I suddenly realized it couldn't have been the tennis stadium, because mm -hmm. that was a mile away, and we didn't walk that far. And then I saw this old, dilapidated, six-story warehouse building, and there were the steps. Mm -hmm. I had transmogrified the memory onto the more heroic building in that neighborhood. And yet the memory was so clear. Now, if I had been right, it just would have been an objection. It still would have been part of me, but it's so much more a part of me that I had made this mixture. Mm -hmm. Oliver, you once wrote <clears throat> in science and in the scientific life, there can be some regaining of an imaged idyllic sort of purity and transparency of childhood. I did. Um, yes. <laughs> it's a nice idea. Mm. I think for myself and perhaps this is so for, for, for all of us, I think the, the roots of scientific wonder go back to childhood wonder. To some extent it's a, uh, it's a, a preservation of childhood wonder, where we're all a bit, we're all a bit childish through this preservation of a sort of wonder and playfulness, and um, uh, we don't, we don't, we don't have it all fixed. Uh, and um, I, perhaps, I had something, something in mind like that. Well, I think that there's a special selection here. Um, nobody here hides uh, his philosophical ambitions. And in a way, I think, you know, philosophers are, this is, these are arrested development children in a certain way. Children are philosophers. And we just never lose that uh, uh, completely childish ambition that we're actually going to understand something very, very deep. We're, we're not just going to put that aside and be grown-ups. We're, we're going to continue to think about those things that fascinated us when we were children. Oliver, um, you, you said uh, in New York, uh, when I'm at a conference, I would like to know the form of passion uh, in my fellows uh, at the conference. I know what the passion is in Stephen Jay Gould, it is love for all the forms of life, and I wonder what the passion is with the philosophers. Well, passion means suffering. I can't forget the original. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's a romantic question, I'm sorry, but that's, but nevertheless. that's important because you don't really get at things unless you invest that kind of devotion. That kind of devotion does entail a great de deal of suffering if only because you have to cast off other things that you'd very much like to do. If I had a better voice, I'd probably be singing Votan today. If I had better bodily skills, I would have played professional baseball. I, fortunately, I had skills in one of the areas that excited my interests, the other two being baseball and opera, where I didn't have skills, and that was paleontology. Ever since I saw a skeleton of Tyrannosaurus when I was five, I found it so thrilling in that ultimate childlike sense of being absolutely overwhelmed. I once asked a psychologist friend of mine why dinosaurs are fascinating to kids. His answer was a little flip, but not inaccurate. He said, big, fierce, and extinct. <laughs> and that's good enough. Nothing rare about being a childhood dinosaur nut. What's rare is to stick with it. And I think the reason I yeah. stuck with dinosaurs is that when I was 10 or 11, I learned evolutionary theory, which I found thrilling because it was that wonderful mixture of science and narrative. Um, my proposal would be that we about childish questions would begin with the theory of evolution 
chronological, starting from the first beginning of life, and then go on. Hmm. Why not the beginning of the universe? I, I think we might as well, if we're going to think big, we might as well Why think not really begin big. before the universe? Okay, well, if we raise childish questions, Daddy, why is the grass green? Uh, mm. Why is the sky blue? Blue? Why does the moon have faces? Mm. Yeah, Steve I can Gould, that. And what was there before <laughs> the Big Bang? Well, if there was any before before the Big Bang, I mean, this is where the paralogisms really bite. Um, I mean, we don't know whether to say that the Big Bang was the beginning of time or whether to say it could be only one of a sequ sequence of events in time, and, and that itself is a a stinker. I think that's going to keep us going all day if we allow ourselves to aborde. <laughs> Was that a program for the morning, the day, or a lifetime? <laughs> uh, well, we will end at eight, finally. Uh, <laughs> so, for six or eight hours, we'll have to discuss it all. But, okay, we can start with the question, what was there before the Big Bang? Uh, uh, a kind of platonic archetype, or God, or Steve Gould is thinking, am not, I going all the way to Hilferson just for answering yeah, those questions? <laughs> yeah. not? It's not a question we can take up. Anything you say is largely expressive of a whole set of personal biases that it would take hours on the couch to unravel. And it may we, not even be a well-formed question, which I think was Steve mm -hmm, Kuhlman's mm -hmm. point, that is, can you use the word before? in that context. It may be simply an inappropriate use of the word. The question whether it's well-formed or ill-formed is at the moment undecidable. But it's a very profound and important question for science, and it's my own starting point. Namely that if we take evolution as a theory referring only to life, we're dealing with a very, very narrow section of a cosmic evolutionary process. And when we actually take the view of the Big Bang, assuming there was one, um, Although most scientists refuse to discuss metaphysical questions and certainly don't want to have God in the picture at all, or if they do, have a kind of neo-deism where he just starts it off, lights the touch paper or something. Um, in fact, there's an implicit assumption throughout the whole of science that all the laws of nature are fixed and that they were all there at the moment of the Big Bang, whether they were there before it or not, is, is an implicit assumption that runs through the thinking of most scientists. And it isn't explicitly formulated, it's present in the implicit assumption that any experiment ought to be repeatable anywhere, any time. The implicit assumption is that the laws of the na nature are the same everywhere, at all times and in all places. No, that's really not so. We, 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 that's something we, we, we are testing all the time. Not I've not met anyone testing it. Can oh, you tell we, me how you're testing it? Or oh, how by looking you're... at these ancient objects in the sky and, and, and verifying whether their spectra follow the same laws as the ones down here. I mean, the, we, we have very direct knowledge of things that were going on at only one quarter of the age of the universe. And but by but assuming that the, the laws were constant, you don't have you to assume. assume. The speed of light is constant, for instance? Well, in, order, we in, even, in order to arrive at any judgments about these early events? No. No, you don't? No. no. We, I mean, you, you, you have things you observe and you can, which you can compare with things that happen nowadays. And so far, the evidence is very strong that they behave the same way, but that's by no means a, 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 a taken for granted. But in fact, it's, it's, it's a very, it's one of the very interesting open questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are very few really good tests, but such as there are, they've always turned out negative. For example? Well, for example, the fine structure of the lines in the quasar, which I, mean, I, d I don't need to get into the technicalities mm. here, but this is, this is a very direct uh, piece of evidence. Uh, it has, it has an, it, it, when you look at the fine structure of carbon at, at, at uh, one quarter of the age of the universe, it turns mm. out to look exactly the same as it does now. Well, you see, I think it's perfectly possible that laws, that the behavior of carbon hasn't changed for three quarters of the age of the universe. But to, um, since I myself think the regularities of nature are more like habits, that I would have said that's a habit built up much earlier on, and they get pretty oh, constant. Uh, uh, th that's but, a perfectly sensible hypothesis. Mm. I mean, we don't go back that far, of course. But uh, if 
if you're putting forward a theory where well, the, the regularities ex exhibited by, say, carbon atoms are, are, are really just habitual, mm -hmm. it's a world of habit, um, uh, does, doesn't that uh, presuppose a sort of law of habit? Uh, why should habits behave the same from, from the Big Bang to the present? Aren't you yourself actually presupposing uh, uh, a regularity which then you use as the basis to explain these other regularities? Yes, I'd, I'd concede that you there's need some... Law of there's one Well, I would say there's a principle of habit in nature, but I would mm -hmm. say it's without specific content. Uh -huh. In other words, that it, the, the law would simply be that self-organizing patterns through repetition become more probable. But uh, it wouldn't no, say eternal. which self-organizing principles come into being, and that there'd be a radical contingency. I think habit is a, is a much deeper and more important principle in nature than we usually think. Law is the preferred metaphor in science, an extremely anthropocentric metaphor based on human laws, which in fact do evolve, of course. Um, habit and, isn't anthropocentric? No, because animals have <laughs> habits. Animals don't have laws. I, it's only human beings that have laws. So I would say the metaphor of laws is much more intensely anthropocentric than the metaphor of habit. It's obvious dogs and cats have habits. It's obvious we have them. Um, so we could say that at least we can broaden the spectrum of habit to include most forms of animal that we know. Habituation, which is a, a kind of habit formation, occurs in unicellular organisms, but laws don't. So I would say this is an intensely anthropocentric metaphor. Well, the sun rises every day, it's pretty law-like. <laughs> Not at all law-like, it it's habit-like. You can see it either way. <laughs> I mean, there, there are some people I know who... David Hume uh, commented on that, I well remember, but... <laughs> But look, Rupert, I mean, you know, if you look at this historically, the fact is that it's not anthropocentric, it's theocentric. You may yes. say the model of God, which is itself an anthropocentric model, an, an anthropomorphic model, but when the idea of constant laws was seriously emphasized mm. in the sciences, which wasn't until well into the 17th century, mm -hmm. I mean, it was part of, it was part of a particular the, uh, theological vision of the Absolutely. universe. So that, mm. um, uh, I mean, what's interesting about your choice of the word, I don't know if you've ever, ever looked up Aquinas on the subject of habitus, but I mean, there is a, you know, I suspect that you come, I suspect you have a more respectable intellectual ancestry than you would like to believe. Um, <laughs> I'm on, I'm nothing against Aquinas, I'm then, in favor of it. Yes, fine, no, no, because I mean, there is, a, I mean, the, the, you know, the, 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 the idea that what we're interested in understanding are these habitus, you know, and, and that this is, I think this is a, you know, this is a, a good part of a traditional, a traditional Aristotelian mm. point of view. It's interesting that really uh, how late it was that people came to this conviction that mm. the laws of nature were, were constant. There was absolute doubt about it before uh, about the middle of the 17th century. It was really a matter of great dispute. And I mean, mm. one reads Sir Thomas Brown on how the entire universe is in decay, how all things, how the greater part of time mm. has gone than is to come, and how, and how we may expect the present dispensation to be, to be dissolved any day now, until you were prepared to believe that the universe was capable of going on for thousands and millions of years in the future. Mm. Uh, it was really, it, it, one was open to these kind of apop uh, apocalyptic ideas that it was mm. all going to fall apart because there wasn't anything like laws of nature to sustain our, mm. our conviction that the thing would keep going. Mm. Or if there were laws, as in Burnett's 17th century geology and others, they were only for that short period of a few yeah. thousand years between the divine creation and the coming suspension of those laws for yeah, the that's mm. right. end of things. Yeah. But that is, in fact, I, I agree with you entirely, the, the idea of eternal laws of nature is, is a, a, a theological, a mechanistic, scientific, theological mixture of those in the 17th century construction, which now that the mind of God's been dissolved away from the world machine for most scientists, they're left free-floating as a kind of habitual assumption in the minds of most scientists. And I want to see just how radical your thesis is. Now, in your view, uh, did triangles just gradually acquire the habit of having uh, right triangles of having uh, the, their, the square on their hypotenuse be equal to the sum of the squares on the side? Is, is, is pi just a habitual ratio between the uh, uh, circumference and the uh, diameter? 
Well, I mean, this is a big question, isn't it? Is yeah. mathematics constructed or is it discovered? I mean, it's a huge philosophical question, and it's not one that I'm terribly concerned with myself. Um, I don't think that there are many right triangles in nature, you see. I think if we get too bogged down in this question, we're dealing with the history of human mathematics. Mm. And it's very easy and very natural for mathematicians to be Platonists, to assume that what they discover, what they find, is somehow a kind of eternal, self-subsistent realm of truth. Well, at least it's timeless. It's timeless. That's right, but I'm not very interested in right triangles and pi. I'm more interested in nature as we observe it, rather than mathematical theories, per se. My point was just that, that scientists who want to go on believing in, in, I would say, timeless constants, timeless regularities, at least have one other source for their, for their one other foundation on which to place this belief, uh, now that they've abandoned uh, an eternal God, they can say, well, it's just like mathematical truth, really. Absolutely. I totally agree. That's the most persuasive argument in favor of it. But the fact is, in the philosophy of mathematics, it's not an undisputed position. Because there are always those who think mathematics is this construction rather than an eternal, self-subsistent realm of ideas. Yeah, so, the, it's an arguable point, it's even within the philosophy of mathematics. I don't think it's a, an evolving construction, I don't think. Not in your sense of evolving. Oh, I think they do. Or at least some of the ones I know mm -hmm. do. I mean, they, they would say, for example, the realm of chaos and fractal mathematics is evolving right now, and it's evolved because of computers. I'm sure you'd like that point about it. You know, computers have made this kind of modeling possible before you just couldn't visualize these mathematical realms. Now, in that sense, is it that we're just discovering new realms of maths that are already there, or are we inventing new realms because we've got a technology to visualize these, these things? I mean, this is a, a disputed point. I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. I'm more inclined to the invention than the discovery of you there. And what I wanted to say is that, I mean, in, in the hard sciences, we mostly talk about models rather than laws. And that is also true of the foundations of mathematics. If you talk to the people who are working on foundations of mathematics, they also talk about models. And it's certainly true of physics and astronomy in particular. And Roughly speaking, a law is just a model that we've got used to, and, and that's in... Uh, mm -hmm. We're habituated to. Yes, and it's not, I mean, there's no, there's, no, there's no sharp distinction between models and laws, I would say, but... Uh, Listening to some of this conversation, I'm reminded of some of the tensions, say, in Jewish theology between the rabbinical God, who is, um, who is a body of law, fixed and immutable, and the Kabbalistic God, who is an organism. And, um, and, and one, one who evolves. And in some sense, I think we are now talking about a change which is in the air between the vision of the universe as static and principled and the universe as, as an organism. Certainly for myself in, in adolescence, I think I moved from my first uh, rather static, um, platonic vision of the universe in the periodic table where carbon and everything was eternally so. Uh, in many Hebrew prayers end up le'olom vo'ed, forever and ever. And the wish that things should be the same forever and ever, you know, is, is very, very attractive, especially after a sort of disturbed, unstable childhood. But then, um, but then the feeling of contingency and, as you say, radical con contingency rushed in on me. Um, but this disposed me to look for uh, principle, laws of change and not changing laws. Yes, I agree. It is a big issue in, in Christian as well as Jewish theology, this question of the evolutionary nature of God. There's a whole yes. school of evolutionary or process theologians. Um, who are trying to get away from the idea of God as totally fixed and, and, and have an evolutionary dimension to God within the evolutionary process. Or we're forced into it. He was such a nasty man early in the books. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to believe he was still like that. <laughs> well, all gods have their shadow side. I mean, this is a feature of all theologies, isn't it? I mean, there are very few gods that are just pure and loving. They always have this negative or destructive quality. But the evolutionary view is, is, you could say they're forced into it by an evolutionary cosmology, in, in the same way that in the 17th century some theologians thought that um, 
they could conceive of God as the maker of eternal laws of nature, kind of Newton's laws and that kind of thing. So, so theology and science interact continuously. Well, one sees this very much even in the, in the titles of some of Paul Davies' books, God and the New Physics and the Cosmic Blueprint and the, mm. the Mind of God. Um, I guess there's sometimes uh, an ironic twist because, uh, of course, the mind of God, as conceived by Newton, was, a, was an immutable, boundless, mm. structureless sensorium. And, um, uh, and the whole point of the cosmic blueprint is that there's no blueprint. But, uh, but the universe is, so to speak, um, organizes or generates or creates itself from mm. continually, though I think not in an unlaw-like manner, but you'd... Well, Paul Davis is a neo-deist. I mean, there's this 18th mm -hmm. century right. view of that God sets all the laws of nature and starts the whole thing off, so you only need God to create it. Um, it has been a resurgence of that under the guise of the cosmological anthropic principle, you know, where you have long discussions about the constants of nature have to be exactly fine-tuned in just the right way, and the assumption is they're really constant, and they've all started off in the right way. And both Paul Davis and also Stephen Hawking, in, in his book, The Brief History of Time, end up with a kind of neo-deism, it seems to me, with a, uh, if not God, then something that fine-tunes all the constants of nature, so we get just this kind of universe. That's what bothers me about the direction that we're going here, as a, as a professional mm -hmm. philosopher among people with philosophical yes, ambitions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that is that I sometimes get the sense that scientists, when they then become amateur philosophers, think that um, different rules apply. Uh, oh. One of my uh, philosophical uh, colleagues, uh, Ronnie D'Souza, uh, reviewing a book on uh, philosophical theology recently, described it as intellectual tennis without a net. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's put some nets up, please. Um, now, this, of course, is, is uh, 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 I realize as I say these words, there's the there's the, uh, the uptight philosopher who doesn't have his own discipline, trying to impose discipline in these areas. Uh, that's, a, that's a galling stereotype in which there's a lot of truth. You're right in this case. Let's but discuss it, things we can answer. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, that's that's uh, my feeling exactly. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, I am uh, just so much more prefer that we start with uh, a set of presumptive nets, uh, which have apparently done some pretty good work, and and just play as hard as we can with those nets. Then, then when we can't play anymore with those nets, we'll replace one of them. Yeah. This is a very, very conservative strategy. Absolutely you right. You adopt it. Steve adopts it. Yeah. I mean, you're. The, the, but uh, if one's ever going to find new models of reality in a radical way, one has to look at where the nets are and what they are. Sure. And you see, your rejection of metaphysics is, I think, a way of avoiding questions you don't want to discuss. I don't avoid them, Rupert. I have a sense of, we're six people here for a day. Hmm. Everybody has to have a personal metaphysics. I have a certain sense that there are questions formally unanswerable, on which, nonetheless, every individual must take a position in order to... Uh, managed to integrate various pieces of his life, we're not going to answer your big metaphysical questions. They have no answers. If we spend the whole day on that, that's what we're going to do. But there's a lot else that. we can discuss that's you interesting. Do, but look, that's you all. do it all the time. I mean, radical contingency is one of your great slogans. And radical contingency seems to, in the way you portray it, seems to other people rather like providence. So. The, the, yeah, but we can talk is, about it. There are animals out there. I can make yes. you a proposal about where I think it exists, and you can tell me why you think it doesn't. So you're but very if you want to discuss the nature of, the, of uh, God's change through time, we've got to define what he, she, it is. Hmm. Uh, but we'll do that forever. That's, <laughs> it's not going to go anywhere. I mean, for instance, in the Middle Ages, there were a lot of people who were very interested in natural philosophy who thought that what we should be going in for was a theory of change kinesis or metaboli, you know, the question was, what is the nature of change as such? And they were very indignant when some people wanted to make, wanted to focus in and look on at locomotion rather than change in general or at, I mean, we know now that the only way of finding about change is to look at 
the different ways in which different kinds of things change, mm. and you know, and and whether the whether we shall ever get back to a kind, uh, uh, the sort of scholastic posture from which we'll be able to say anything about the nature of change as such. Who knows? It, we're not there yet. We're much better off by looking at by looking at the different ways in which different kinds of changes take place. So I do, you know, I just beg you, you know, to ask yourself whether you aren't asking us, whether you aren't asking, I mean, does you know, the father who says to the child, fetch that orange from off the mantel shelf, and when the child takes it and brings it to him and says, no, that's not what I, this, the orange is no longer the orange on the mantel shelf. I mean, you know, there are, there are all these, <laughs> you know, there, there, are, there, are, there are all these ways in which the problem can be kind of forcibly made insoluble, and I, I would hate I'm it. I'm not if, trying to do that. No. I'm trying to set up a testable theory which can is being tested. Yeah, but it has to be a theory which is not over, gen, over, over general in its initial mode of formulation, and maybe. And maybe the questions you quite rightly want to have answered are going to have to be answered piecemeal by taking them one step at a time and looking at a, looking at a lot of different cases and seeing whether, uh, after we've been working at it for two or three hundred years, we're in a position to, uh, at, at last, to, to, to generalize. Does it, does it seem to be an unfair move I'm making? Oh, yes, absolutely. It sounds just like your father in saying it's an illegitimate <laughs> question. <laughs> it seems to me... No, he, didn't, he, didn't, he just didn't even realize there was a question. <laughs> right. He thought it was only him and the truth. <laughs> All right. Well, no, you're not saying that then. Well, no, I think that the... The question of how radically evolutionary is reality is a very important question. And I think you can ask it in a variety of ways, in a variety of ways, and test it. And I think, for example, one of my predictions is that the melting points of new chemical compounds should increase for, for a while. When you first made them, the melting points are not physical constants. The usual assumption is that they are. They are. You can test this theory in the realm of chemistry. Do melting points of new compounds change? The answer is they do. Uh, there's a lot of empirical evidence for it. Then chemists come along and say, well, it's got nothing to do with habits in nature. That's just because people get better at making purer compounds, which have higher melting points. Then you say, well, how do you know they're purer compounds? And they say, well, they must be purer because they've got higher melting points. Mm. So here's an empirical question one can actually get to grips with, which I am getting to grips with uh, as one example, um, where these issues can be focused and asked in a scientific way. Let, let, let's have a look at common evolutionary theory uh, for, for <coughs> uh, a moment. Um, Steve Gould, uh, you said that uh, even today the, the theory of natural selection is widely misunderstood, misquoted and misapplied. Well, I try to misquote, misapply <laughs> and misunderstand. If I say, one, evolution has no purpose. Two, matter is the crown of all existence. Yes. Three, evolution is not a critical process. Four, evolution has no direction. Do I misunderstand what you're meaning about you natural selection? You don't misunderstand much of what I'm meaning, but if you asked to the general educated public what is Darwinism, you wouldn't hear any of those four. No, I think you see the major misunderstandings of Darwin and their vernacular misunderstandings, though there are many professional ones as well, have to do with the fact that evolution deals with questions that are so much at the heart of those troubling issues that everyone has to figure out in constructing some sense of meaning for their lives. Mm -hmm. Why are we here? And so far as science can deal with that question at all, what are we related to? How did we get here? And the background of this is this frightening fact that people understand, namely that we've only been here for a millimicrosecond of life's history, which does lead to the plain solution, which I happen to think is true, that maybe we weren't destined to be here and maybe if you could replant the tree of life from seed we'd never get here again. It's in the context of those fears. Now these traditional psychological comforts that come out of that or that stand against it and which can still validate our traditional hopes of humans being on top of a heap and therefore ruling the rest of the world by right, or at least being the end product of a predictable process meant to arrive at us. We're not willing to abandon any of those notions. And so we read them back into Darwinism, even though the bare bones mechanics of Darwin's theory does not speak of them explicitly. After all, Darwin's theory in its barest bones mechanics is a theory about adaptation to changing local circumstances. That's really that's all it all is. That is, if, to caricature it, if it's cold in Russia, 
long time ago, and there are some elephants there. Elephants that have slightly longer hair will, as a statistical average, do better in leaving offspring, and a thousand generations down the line you'll get woolly mammoths, but they're not better elephants. They're just elephants that are better suited to the transitory environments of that place. Since the vector of environmental change through time is effectively random, if organisms under Darwin are tracking those environmental changes, you're not going to generate a directional pattern eventually leading up to human beings. Now, Darwin was also an eminent Victorian, not quite willing completely to divest himself of these psychological comforts and sociological presuppositions. So he, in fact, did manage to insinuate in a different way progress back into his system, mainly by arguing that most competitive interactions were not between organism and environment, but between organism and other organism. And when organisms struggle with organisms, a kind of biomechanical improvement in the long run might result. But that conclusion is quite separate from what I call the bare bones mechanics of natural selection, which does not validate that notion of progress. And one of the reasons why Darwin has been so difficult to assimilate is this radical philosophical message of his theory. Steve, one thing about your um, uh, diagnosis of the anxiety that the lay people have about evolution uh, has puzzled me in the past because you suggest that it is uh, um, oppressive to some people to suppose that uh, if we ran the tape of, of time again, uh, human beings would not be uh, would not be created again. But it seems to me it's just as oppressive either way. Uh, uh, what bothered Nietzsche was the idea of the eternal <laughs> recurrence. He viewed that as as as, as such a nauseating prospect that he he, he really tolerate uh, he contemplated not ever revealing to the world what he what he discovered. This horrible, horrible. Uh, idea of uh, that it would all happen the same way again and again and again. Now, now you seem to think that that the the uh, uh, the ordinary person uh, is uh, oppressed or or becomes anxious at the prospect that that the Homo sapiens is a unique and unrepeatable uh, phenomenon, whereas it might be the other way around. No, I think there's a real difference. Uh, the the Avika Vita care of Nietzsche and others, the, the fear behind that is that there's no directionality. It's, just, it's the platonic great year that it goes round and round. There's nothing distinctive. And Borges captured that wonderfully in the Book of Sand, where he gets this vulgar book where there's a picture every 2,000 pages, but you can never reach its end, and there's no pattern in the pictures, and finally realizes it's a completely vulgar book because of its incomprehensibility, because there is no directionality and no pattern. So he loses it in the stacks of the Argentine National Library. I think that's a different kind of fear, and that we certainly have. I don't know how else to respond to that. I don't mean to sound elitist, but Dennett and Nietzsche are one group, and then there's Homo Ordinarius, which is also Dennett and me and everyone else. And uh, I don't know, it seems to me that most folks, at least in Western culture, really are seeking to validate Protagoras' old dictum, which may be only literally about half of us, but it's all of us, that man is the measure of all things. And we want to define things in terms of ourselves. We want to see ourselves as paramount. We want to see ourselves as ruling this world by right. And folded into that is the necessity of thinking that four and a half billion years of the history of the earth and three and a half of life's explicit fossil history is in some sense, I don't mean necessarily generating us with two eyes and two feet, but two feet, two feet, is nonetheless likely to move towards a complexification which will eventually end in a self-conscious creature very much like us, then we make sense, then we're here for purpose, we rule by right. Is the conclusion, okay, consciousness is something sublime and whimsical, as Steve Gould wrote, um, it's a weird invention, uh, that it's powerful doesn't mean it m is meant to be, it wasn't uh, developed to uh, paint or write symphonies. 
natural selection builds this complex computer called the brain for a set of highly complex things. But being the complex computer that it is, it is surely capable of doing orders of magnitude more things by virtue of its internal sure. structure and not immediately by the construction of natural selection. And these side consequences, these spandrels, as I call them, can overwhelm the original adaptive meaning. Oh, it still is, uh, to me, very mysterious that we have this capacity for solving differential equations. And I, yeah. I, I, wasn't built by natural selection directly. I agree. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. And I, I don't think anybody really <laughs> should, mm. should pretend to understand it. But. The, the sort of ghost of, of final causes is, yes. is, is, is haunting us all um, at this table and, 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 and sort of generally. Um, but, but Rupert, you, you're, it's not clear to me whether you're unhappy with the existing mechanisms postulated or whether, or whether somehow something teleological is, is, is at the back of your morphogenetic fields, morphic resonance. I think it's an open question. I mean, I think that the, there could be uh, an, an overall uh, organizing principle e imminent within the cosmos, maybe transcending the com cosmos, maybe imminent within the Earth or the solar system, that draws evolution towards the evolution of a, a human consciousness or consciousness in general. There could be, but on the other hand, maybe there isn't. Maybe it's uh, materialists will always say it's chance, you see, and, and it's a philosophical position. I, I like to have an open mind on that one, but uh, I don't think that. I don't think we can rule it out. I don't think we can rule out the possibility of consciousness descends from a higher source. Uh, that's one theory of it, in favor of the idea it ascends from a lower form of organization. They seem two different ways of looking at it. Um, I read somewhere that when Clark Maxwell was a child, he liked to say of everything, what's the go of it? What's the go of it? Sometimes, what's the particular go of it? And we are we are all one way and another talking about the the go of it, from um, from the uh, from the go of, of individual bacteria to the to the to the go of the universe. Mm. Um, I I think I probably uh, um, agree with. Stephen, although my my emotions would like to tell me something different, I think I probably agree that we sort of um, that we have arrived here by uh, by a series of chances, coincidences, concatenations. Mm. Um, although I um, although of course the in the nature of things, perhaps the the tendency is always always towards greater complexity. But then but then 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 not even that. But we don't know, do we? Even in the case of our own individual lives, there's a sense in which all of our lives have many elements of contingency in them. I mean, tremendous elements of contingency. It's a favorite subject of fiction. Um, but whether or not each of us has an, uh, some underlying entelechy or purpose or goal is a question that most of us couldn't even answer about ourselves, um, let alone the whole evolutionary process. Uh, I mean, there are many people who think that they're just responding to circumstances living in the present, and then psychoanalysts will come along and say, oh, well, actually, there's some childhood programming here that you haven't been aware of, and many of us are un influenced by unconscious patterns. But that's personally contingent unconscious patterns. You can't analogize that into externally universal ones. Why not? I mean, if we're dealing with... I mean, it's not a logical move. I'm not saying it's inconceivable that such exist, but it is not evidence for oh, their I being. I wasn't using it as evidence. I was yeah. saying that even in our own case, where there's a large play of contingency, which we'd all admit, it's an open question as to how much uh, there's any overall t loss or goal in, our, in what we do. And so I would say that um, in the case of... The, to show contingency in the history of life, which you do convincingly and repeatedly, um, still, to my mind, leaves open the question as to whether it's just blind chance or uh, whether there's anything more at work. Well, it's not just blind chance. The question is at what That's level what predictability enters. I think there are broad scale predictabilities. I will grant you bilateral symmetry in moving organisms. I'll grant you predator-prey ratios in functioning ecosystems. What I won't give you is 
the inevitability of Homo sapiens rather than some other lineage, or insects rather than opabinids, which died, or trilobites rather than anomalocarids, which didn't make it. It is in all the details of particular lineages that contingency rules. Now, that wouldn't be a problem if we could just say, well, I don't care about the detail. Science, after all, is fundamentally the search for the generalities. Sure, the details are contingent, but they're below our notice. They're not below our notice for one fundamental historical, sociological, and psychological fact, and that is man is the measure of all things. We happen to be enormously interested in ourselves, no matter how general we make our theories. They are in some fundamental sense about ourselves, and ourselves are homo sapiens, one of those little <laughs> contingent twigs. So we can't claim we're only interested in the generality. We want them to relate to us, and we happen to be in the domain of contingency. I should have no difficulty agreeing that, say, human consciousness is, in some regards, um, the amplification of events that were ultimately just contingent, just random. Not even, not only that, but uh, every thought we think probably has a contingent seed uh, or many contingent seeds in its own development. Uh, in our own brains, uh, th that I chose exactly these words rather than some other form of words, uh, probably uh, depends on random or pseudo-random or arbitrary or contingent uh, uh, states of some part of my brain. Mm. But once that process of, say, designing this very utterance begins to get rolling, mm -hmm. then all sorts of regularities are imposed on that because what comes out is roughly a grammatical sentence of English, never, ever a sentence of Chinese, and, and, and not usually total gibberish. Mm. But you see, one of the criticisms of your contingency view is that some people would see the working of providence as being some guiding principle in evolution which doesn't have to have a plan made up in advance, doesn't have to be designing human beings. Maybe it works rather like we do, responding to new circumstances uh, with choices and decisions and movements in one direction yeah, rather than another. There's an obvious response to that, Rupert, which although conventional, I think is correct operationally in this case, and that is if in principle one can always, for any sequence, no matter how, peculiar with respect to any expectations of regularity, if we can always say, but maybe it is the workings of preordained plans being so complex that we can't possibly discern their directionality for, in the old line, God works in many ways as wonders to perform. At that point, it's not a useful hypothesis because one will say, no matter what the pattern is, maybe it is a preordained plan we don't know about, to which I have to say, yes, maybe it is, but since formally we'll never know, I can't work with that, and I have to therefore work without it. It is, is nothing that science could ever adjudicate, for example. And I think this was, in fact, a fine solution. Pius XII, who's not one of my heroes for other reasons, decreed in an encyclical in the 1930s that science, the, pardon me, that Catholics were free to believe anything science discovered about the evolution of the human corporeal form, so long as they continued to accept that at some point God infused the soul into this sequence. I'm totally comfortable with that notion. I can't deal with souls. I don't know what they are. They're nothing we could ever know about, whether they're there or not. I'm entirely comfortable for that. In my own personal theology, there is no such concept, but it doesn't threaten anything I can do in science if some people accept that directive. The issue that we're concerned with as scientists is what we can say about the evolution of human corporeal form, and many other things indeed. Now that, that just becomes a subsidiary hypothesis, comforting and coherent for some, and perfectly fine. But I think that's too easy a way out. I mean, mm. you know, it isn't that the word soul is just a theological term which is arbitrarily intruded. I mean, the question is, for instance, what does it mean to say that somebody develops a conscience? Oh, yeah. You know, then, yeah. you know, the, yeah, there are still we, must be able, we must be able to study these things, too. You know, and... Yes, um, we can. You know, I don't think it's the case that you can just sort of say, oh, well, if you want to talk about soul, soul, schmoll... Oh, but I wasn't meaning soul, I mean, good old theological... No, but the, you, you, the, oh. look, theology is a much more of a pedestrian down-to-earth subject than you're allowing it to be. You're, think, you're talking about it in a, in a sort of 19th century rationalist way that this is, you know, this is something we can just push, 
push aside. I don't think it's, it's not as easy as that. The, but I think it's what was meant in that particular context. Mm -hmm. if, if by soul you mean the origins of feelings of morality and consciousness, yes, of course, that's a subject I we think, need to address. I think you would find that there were a whole lot of things that we would regard as legitimate scientific issues that people who were of Pius the Twelfth's way of thinking would have been very uncomfortable to think about scientists in, in, in going in for. But if Steve Gould is right, because I just want to know if every, everybody agrees, perhaps except Rupert Sheldrake, uh, through no fault of our own and by dint of no cosmic plan or conscious purpose, we have become, by the power of a glorious evolutionary accident called intelligence, the stewards of life's continuity on Earth. Does everybody agree? No. By dint of no um, cosmic plan or conscious purpose. Um, mm. But 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 we're not up to stewardship yet. I, I mean, you 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 you've said well, two things, and the yes. first thing is, are we agree that we we happen to happen? Yes. And uh, a kind of unconscious design of consciousness, so to say. I agree well, only well, up to a uh, point well, with well, that. Well, I, I, I don't know whether the word, yeah. the word design mm. in, in, in any sense can, can be, no. be allowed. Um, uh, um, uh, I'm afraid I rather think in tangents. Um, for some reason, uh, um, just darted into my mind a, um, a paper written in, in 1858, the year before, about um, some of the s strange, complex geometrical patterns which can occur in the aura, the visual stage of, of a migraine. Uh, I'm partly riding a hobby horse of mine here, but um, it, uh, these particular things came into my mind again recently, partly because there was a strange exhibit of paintings, a hundred paintings of their geometrical hallucinations by people with migraine. And I showed some reproductions of these to a friend of mine who was working uh, with neural networks and computers. And he said that when some of the parameters sort of went wrong, he saw patterns like this. And now, now one gets the sense that these patterns are, are examples of, of self-organization. Um, but yet they have beautiful designs in a sort of geometrical and aesthetic sense. I mean, some of them are like radiolaria and sea urchins, and, and uh, you know, one feels in a sense some of the problems of, of organic form and morphogenesis can, you know, can perhaps be looked at in a sort of um, elegant, hallucinatory way with, with these. But it's, um, incidentally, the, an aura is never the, is never the same. Um, people, there are certain sorts of designs, certain lattices, certain sort of hexagonal forms which, which come up again and again, but they are never, never exactly the same. And when, when you wrote of the, um, of the, Burg of the Burger Shale and, uh, and of life, you know, if it, were, if it were rewound, taking a different form, I partly get this feeling in the few minutes of a migraine aura, each, each time, it is improvised differently. You never see the same aura. And, um, but this, uh, and I think I probably got, got off on a tangent, but, you know, but somehow, um, I think the most difficult thing is to, um, is to get rid of the notion of design somehow. Um, I, I, I'm afraid I have another irrelevant uh, irrelevance, and then, I, and then I'll shut up. Um, um, once, when I was um, driving down in uh, into Baja, California, in Mexico, um, there were many beautiful cactus gardens by the road, and one of them was particularly enchanting. I, I got out with a friend, a zoologist, and this was an immense garden. And the, uh, the range, the ingenuity, the beauty was quite extraordinary. And uh, we were amazed at the, uh, at the brilliance of the gardener, and uh, who could have made such a, a huge, various garden. And then we came over the brow of the hill, and we saw that it was nature. <laughs> and, uh, and I'd mistaken nature for a garden. Um, I don't know what that may say about, about design or telos or aesthetics or, or anything else. I want to go back to your 
citation of Steve Gould's point about our just yes. happening to be here. No fault of our own. No fault of our no, own. By dint of no cosmic plan or yes. conscious, conscious right. purpose. If, if we change the last two phrases a little bit, I, I'd accept it. But I think one of the things that's very important about human beings, which tends to get lost in, in, in this discussion, is one thing that does make us unique uh, uh, as a species is that for the last five or 10,000 years, we have been, to a large degree, the uh, beneficiaries of conscious planning by our parents and their parents and the cultures in which we've resided. The, we today are actively concerning ourselves with what the world is going to be like and what people are going to be like in the future. We have strong beliefs about this, we have traditions, that, and, and they are not impotent. They play a role in what humanity, what Homo sapiens is going to be like a thousand years from now, if it survives. And if a thousand years from now, uh, some Homo sapiens were to sit around a table and say, we are not in any sense the product of any planning, they'd be wrong, because uh, uh, we, uh, cultural transmission is uh, one of the features of cultural transmission, which is really, with very modest exceptions, only uh, a, a feature of, of our species. That's its discordance from the natural process mm -hmm. that's come up to now. Yes, that's you right. I mean, it's, we've created a new medium that's of why design. I'm calling it cultural evolution because I want to emphasize the differences. Well, but it's mm. both. It's it's both a continuation and it's a, and it's a radical. There's also some radical discontinuities. In some regards, it is simply another medium of evolution, very fast, and with uh, now some real helping hands, some real foresight, some real planning. But of course, myopic foresight, myopic planning, uh, and a good measure of noise amplification, a good measure of irrational or irrational uh, selection. There's Nevertheless... Two, there's two features that natural biological genetics doesn't have. One is right. Lamarckian inheritance. We teach our yes. children what we sure. learn. And the other is the anastomosis of lineages. Once a species yeah. is separate, sure. it's separate forever. Our lineages. And that both of those enormously accelerate the process Absolutely. and make it planable. Mm -hmm. yes. Of sure. course, that's right. Yeah. But, but then you also agree, though, that, that uh, a large contribution from that very process is to what we are. I mean, if somebody asks, well, what, what is a human being really? Is a human being just, you know, the genetic foundations? No, the, uh, the, the cultural contributions are immense. Yeah, biological evolution made that, but yeah. it is yeah. this other process yeah. that has introduced the self-planning into it. Before we dive into consciousness, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, this famous statement, Charles Darwin, what a book a, a, a devil's chaplain might write on the uh, clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low, horrible works of nature. Uh, do we define nature as unconscious and non-moral and our own species as conscious and moral? Can we make this distinction? Then we know where we are. Well, Darwin wrote that. You have to understand the context of that letter. He wrote it in 1855 to, to Hooker. Joseph Hooker, and it was, uh, I think, it was a sardonic and sarcastic mm -hmm. comment. And I think Darwin had a very definite solution in mind. He points out that if one were to try and extract moral messages from nature, and rather than reading Paley, Natural Theology of 18.2, which had been Darwin's great textbook as a young man. Paley goes through all the wonderful designs and harmonious ecosystems of nature, thereby telling us that we can only, not only infer God's existence, but also his benevolence, his goodness, his omniscience. Darwin says, but if you really look at nature, there's so much out there that is ugly. And the examples he chooses are interesting. He chooses two. He says, I do not see how a loving God could create the ichneumonids with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars, the reference being to these wasps, hundreds of species of them, that inject their eggs into the paralyzed living bodies of caterpillars. The eggs hatch, and the juvenile wasp larvae eat the caterpillar, still alive, but very carefully, because they don't want to kill it and cause it to decay, saving the heart and nervous system for last. <laughs> And the second example Darwin gives is, or that a cat should play with mice. And when we watch cats playing with not yet dead mice, usually some sense of horror arises in us, even if we understand that might be an inappropriate reaction. So Darwin's saying if you actually look at nature in the raw and more fairly, you will see many natural phenomena which would be very hard to see 
as the results of a kind, loving, and efficient God. And that's, therefore, he says, the low, blundering, inefficient. But you see, Darwin's solution is not that. Darwin's solution is that, therefore, <laughs> nature, being, nature is neither moral nor immoral. It's amoral. We should not be trying to extract moral messages from nature at all. And I think well, that's right. Nature can't learn us any ethics. Does it, no, but everybody this is, agree? But this, or? No. No, that's no quite on the contrary, no, I would say it has we have an enormous lot to learn from nature. About ethics. Like what? Yes, <laughs> yes like what? Well, the... the uh, I, I, I mean, I, 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 I consider history as part of nature, I suppose, but I don't make any... Uh, we, we are in bad trouble here because you, you know, you're talking as though the word nature was quite univocal and as though nature always meant nature as distinguished from humanity. Yes, that's what I, I mean. I mean, there is a, this again, this is, again, this is a 17th century, uh, a 17th century move mm. and uh, which we've spent much of the 20th century digging ourselves out from under. I mean, certainly before 1600 and certainly since 1950, it's unforgivable to use the word nature as though humanity were not part of nature. You know, so that, I mean, if you, uh, 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 that being so, I mean, there's a sense in which everything, including even the human reason, as Aquinas thought, uh, you know, is itself in an important sense natural. And all of these were things that Aquinas talks about under the heading of ratio naturalis. Um, uh, so that I think we have to, I mean, we have to be careful to avoid insisting on asking questions which arose with the kind of force they did only because of the 17th century mistakes which lasted on into the early 20th century, which we are now in a position, thank God, to, to, to get away from. But at the moment I asked, for instance, Oliver or Dan, is nature non-moral, not amoral, non-moral? Which nature? They, the nature that they, includes humanity or the nature that it, it no, excludes na nature, humanity? that excludes mm -hmm. humanity. And that is what I meant, this, mm -hmm. except for the new... new uh, I uh, uh, think Hobbes had it just about right, and that is that uh, the state of nature, meaning excluding human civilization, is uh, a world in which there is neither right or wrong, and so there is really no morality there at all. The uh, the uh, the uh, the cheetah uh, catches the antelope, and uh, uh, various uh, uh, blood curdling things happen in that natural world. But there isn't any morality at all. That morality is uh, is a human either creation or discovery. I think it's actually legitimate to to look at trees as an instance of the tragedy of the commons. Saying the if only those trees could have gotten together and agreed not to compete with each other for the sunlight, then they wouldn't have had to waste all those resources in growing those great big tall trunks. I mean, uh, the, the formal properties of the tragedy of the comet are right there in the forest. And we can, on the one hand, from our anthropocentric point of view, we can be very grateful that those forests are there. But from, as it were, from the tree's point of view, it's a terrible waste. Yes, when you talk about humans and other species, then you said that the, if you say that humans have, for instance, souls, uh, the other species have not. You said there isn't such a sharp edge. If oh, you're I talking think, about... Yes, I think that one of the artifacts of, and I think of our culture is the idea also. that consciousness is a light which is either on or off. Yeah. And that the universe is sundered into the things that it's like something to be and the things that it isn't like something to be. I think that's a big mistake. Uh, uh, I think there's all sorts of gradations. But uh, that means that there really are gradations and that one should be very cautious about supposing that the questions that are properly asked about, say, our sort of consciousness, which is the one we know the most about because we talk about it's it us. and it's us, uh, that we, supposing that we can meaningfully ask the same questions about the consciousness of the bat or the dolphin uh, or the spider, uh, that's a very risky uh, extrapolation. Um, I think one does have the feeling of um, extreme divisions, for example, between the, the plant and the animal world. Um, uh, a few days ago, I was driving around in upstate New York, and uh, it was very beautiful fall weather, and I was 
um, conscious of trees and meadows, um, I didn't realize that I hadn't seen an animal, I mean a macroscopic animal, um, uh, until after about an hour I caught sight of a cow and um, suddenly its, it, its, its animation seemed a thing of extreme wonder to me. I had the feeling of it sampling the environment, of, of sensory sheets lighting up and an and, um, uh, incredible thing, a cow. It was, um, you know, nothing, nothing like it in the vegetable world. And, and it seems to me, as a start, that there's been a sort of, a sort of dichotomy between, between the paths of, of vegetables and animals and, um, and perhaps many other dichotomies sort of within. Um, I can't get the same feeling about insects as I have, say, from mammals, I think there is something radically different about the sort of, or deeply different about the sort of nervous system and mind and the way they've gone. Um, I'm, um, I, I'm not sure about, about, about octopuses. I, um... <laughs> See, I think, it's, I, think it's pure, I think it's pure aesthetics. Yeah. And I think people who try and construct moral arguments for vegetarianism, for example, will just never succeed. Carrots are as highly evolved as a lot of things we eat. But I respect the aesthetic argument. You look into the eye of a mammal, and because the genealogical relationship is close enough, and there are homologously shared emotional reactions, we see enough of ourselves in the cow. There are many vegetarians who will eat fish, but not <coughs> so-called red meat, and I think it's very yes, much the one, same, yes. same point. We look in the eye of a fish, we don't see it, because I don't think there's as much homologously shared. From an evolutionary point of view, arthropods are wondrous in their complexity. I would, and many of the groups of arthropods are far later evolved than fishes, so I don't know that one can make that distinction. And if there was an oyster, which when you opened it up for curious reasons, just had what looked exactly like a human face on it, most people would be extremely reluctant to eat it for no other reason, I'm sure. No, but I do think there are, you know, there are some more serious reasons. And Steve, I'm sure, I seem to recall somebody telling me that Crocodiles don't dream, but birds do. I mean, that the, that that is some that 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 the, the question of what kinds of families and the, the, so the, on. The, 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 I, I have the, the, uh, the, echid the echidna and, doesn't dream. Hmm? I think the echidna doesn't echidna. dream. But it's aesthetics due to homologous to shared mm -hmm. characters. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I agree with you. But aesthetics yeah. is a serious subject. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. No, that's use it as a no. I don't use this as a brush away. Stephen, I wasn't. I wasn't. I was seriously saying that I absolutely respect. The aesthetic <laughs> justification yeah, yeah. for vegetarianism. Mm. I just wish people would define it. That. No, no, I ultimately respect the But still, but still the the question, but the question. Yeah. No lack I mean, of you respect. see, you you can be, you can be Tom Nagel and suggest that there's no way in which we could empathise with a bat. Uh, you know, on the other hand, there are ways. That, you know, there are very <laughs> interesting like questions about the the extent to which it's not unreasonable to think that 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 different species have. Exper uh, ha have a ki kinds of experience that are, in certain crucial respects, mm -hmm. more or less like mm -hmm. ours. I mean, e.g., are they capable of dreaming? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's uh, uh, intractable even to the cold, hard, objective methods of science, I think. Well, I'm talking well, about this as a scientific question. Yeah, I mean, sure. I, think, I think much of what Steve chooses to call aesthetics is also part of science. But uh, yeah, but I mean, uh, uh, I think that we're making tremendous progress on, on uh, getting the information so we'll be able to say exactly what it's like to be a bat. Uh, it's still a long way off, but, but we can say a lot about what it isn't like now already because we know about enough about limitations on the, the bat's totally. nervous system and we know that, uh, that it just can't be like, like some people might imagine it to be, and this is already progress. I find this discussion really provincial. I mean, we're assuming that consciousness is confined to animals on Earth. What about the consciousness of the sun, for example? If we take, as um, many traditional views have taken the idea there's some kind of mind associated with the sun, if people are happy to agree that the interface between mental activity and brain function are changing electromagnetic patterns. There are plenty of those on the sun. The more research that goes on on the sun, the more we find about their tremendous complexity. So what about the idea that the sun might be thinking or have some kind of mental activity associated with these electromagnetic patterns? 
mean, I, I can immediately hear Steve's response. It's a meaningless concept. You can think of it if you like, but... Um, it's close to that, Rupert, but I... <laughs> <laughs> but I would make you the challenge. The moment you can propose to me some way where we might uh, have the sun talk to us and know about its consciousness, then I'm willing to take it up as a subject. Before then, frankly, I, I'm not. I, I'd put it yeah. stronger. Um, if you can give us any reason to think that that... The, that there's a raison d'etre to the sun's consciousness. I mean, the reason we're conscious is that we are the evolved products that had to fend for ourselves. I mean, if you go back to what Oliver said about the division between plants and animals, basically that's a division, I think, between, between uh, a very sort of conservative strategy, which is sort of hunker down and put your hands over your head and hope for the best, which is the plant strategy, and then there's the sort of guerrilla warfare strategy of the animals that become locomotory and then they develop distal perception systems. No use having eyes if you don't have feet or something like it. Uh, trees with eyes would just be in despair because they couldn't <laughs> run away Snakes. when they saw a danger coming. So if you can give us a reason for thinking that, that the sun has some use for its mind, uh, then I think we can take it seriously that it might have one. Otherwise, it seems to me to be uh, just a, a, um, an idle fantasy. Well, the thing is that in order to pursue this fantasy, you see, it rather goes back over ground we've already covered. Is there some guiding principle in the, in the evolution of life on Earth? Well, maybe if the sun has a mind, it's, as it were, the brain of the whole solar system, not just of the Earth. And that if one looks for a guiding intelligence, then I would look for the guiding intelligence first mm -hmm. in the sun and the whole solar system, rather than leaping straight to Paley's mm -hmm. view of a mechanical god. Uh, and then there's the galaxy, the entire galaxy. The sun's like a cell in the entire galaxy. And we don't know what the mind of the galaxy might be like, I mean, its thoughts would be faster than empires and more slow, considering the speed of light and how big it is. But these are possibilities that one can speculate about. Mm. And, but since it's all speculation anyway, it seems to me they, they may be very relevant to this whole question of the evolutionary process. So that may be something... You asked what the sun could be doing. Yes, there's a, a philosophical distinction, which I'm not uh, always uh, happy to invoke, but it seems to me to be appropriate here, between... Uh, rule following behavior and rule described behavior. And the standard example that philosophers use, they say, look, the, uh, the planets, as it were, uh, uh, obey the, the laws of planetary motion, but they don't do this by, as it were, following them. They don't, they don't have to calculate what the law prescribes for them to do and then do it. They can't make mistakes. Yeah, you know? that's right. So, so there's really no sense in, I mean, planets don't, don't need a mind in order to figure out how to uh, stay in their orbits, and it doesn't seem to me that the solar system needs well, a mind in order to uh, maintain its, uh, its regularities, well, whether they're habits or eternal. I those regularities, you see. I mean, I mean, the regularities of the planet's orbits, uh, that's not what I was thinking of. I was thinking of, of, of the details of evolution on Earth or of evolution on Mars, Jupiter, or any other planet. The very precise questions we were talking about now. We know that sunspot cycles affect cycles of events on Earth and so on. So here's a very crude example everyone could agree on, but I think it may go much further than that. Um, I, I, um, I wonder whether one needs to bring in some, some new words, like, for example, spontaneity in relation to, to organisms. Now, this was specifically done by Harvey, a rather fascinating book which he wrote in the same year as he wrote The Circulation of the Blood. It was a book on, on animal motion. As a young man, he'd been to Galileo's lectures in Padua, and the first half of the book is a, um, an analysis of animal motion in terms of inertia and momentum and, and so forth, and uh, the fact that the physical determinants are never... Um, are, are always obeyed. But in the second half of the book, he, he says there's more, he, and he speaks of, uh, of spontaneity and grace, and um, he, he can no longer call on physical models, and then he starts to use metaphors. He talks about music, and the silent music of the body. But um, this strikes me as a rather nice early treatise on animation mm. and, and on the nature of the animate. Um, you know, there's, there's been a, um, what maybe is a nice breakthrough on one interesting aspect of animal motion coming out of our artificial intelligence. Uh, in, in a most uh, uh, improbable uh, research program, uh, 
young artificial intelligence uh, researcher, a roboticist named Mark Reber, decided to solve the running robot problem. And his bizarre first idea was he was going to make a one-legged, let's just start simple, make a one-legged running robot. And so what he made was basically a robot pogo stick. And uh, it actually works. There's no knee, there's no ankle, it's just a pogo stick, on a, and, and, but the thing hops away quite quite handsomely and it and it and it keeps maintaining its balance and that's what the that's what the software does then he thought well that's I've solved the one-legged robot problem uh, how about the two-legged robot problem so he simply took two of these contraptions and put them together and now he said well I've got a software problem now how I know how to control a one-legged robot how do I control a two-legged robot and he realized this was his real breakthrough he had actually already solved the problem he simply um, had this robot, as it were, make the same calculations it was making in its one-legged form, but now with a virtual leg, as it were, an imaginary leg, which was in between the two. And then, of course, it had to keep making corrections because its real legs weren't where its imaginary leg was, so that it had to keep... Uh, but this one hopped on two legs just fine. And he thought, now I've got the two-legged robot problem solved. What about the four-legged robot problem? So he put four of these together, sort of like a horse. And now the question was, should he put the virtual legs between the two front legs He's going to have two virtual legs now, between the two front legs and the two back legs, between the left legs and the right legs, or should he do them crisscross? And he didn't know. He said, I'll try it all three ways. And he tried it, and what he got was walk, trot, and canter. Now, now before he did that, I would guess that most people who thought about the complexities of walk, trot, and canter would say, that's a problem that's just forget about it. It's beyond robotics. It's, it's just much too complicated to have any sense of what the control structure in the horse's brain might be that could tip it into these three different uh, gates uh, with, with a little nudge. And now, maybe Reber doesn't have the answer, but I'll bet he's got a part of it because it fell out so naturally from this, from this program. Um, uh, I, I, I want to sort of say, say both. Um, uh, I think that the transition from walk to trot to canter uh, can be modelled relatively simply. But having said that, I think that um, walking an animal motion is not just an, an alternation of limbs. Um, I think the opening sentence in Leviathan is something like, like life is a, is a motion of limbs, isn't it? Something like, like that. Um, but uh, the um, uh, specifically, if one has Parkinson's disease, if one has Parkinsonism, one's walking does then become rather mechanical. One has this peculiar gait called festination. Typically, when people have this, they use the passive tense. They say, I am walked. I had one patient, a, um, a former music teacher who became Parkinsonian, and she said that she felt her gait had become robotic as she became Parkinsonian. She said she had become demusicked or unmusicked and that she needed to be remusicked, which she could be by listening to music or imagining music to, to walk normally again. And whether these considerations of, uh, um, of, of rhythm and kinetic melody uh, can be reducible to Galilean or robotic terms or or whether, or whether some quite other sort of organization is needed, I don't know. But I think that some of the problems of, um, uh, of, of, of living organization come up even at this level of locomotion, and you don't yet have to sort of move, move to consciousness. Uh, Daniel Dennett, you said, I think that a robot could definitely be conscious in exactly, unmetaphorically, the same way as we are. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are a sort of robot, we are organic robots created by a research and development process called natural selection and also of course by a learning process in our own lifetimes. Uh, I think it would be more expensive than going to the moon, but yes we could do it in principle. And one of the reasons you won't do it is that you would have to give a robot with our consciousness human rights. Of course. Of course. At the same time, Oliver, quoting you out of all your books, <laughs> well, why are you laughing? Of course you have to give them civil rights. It's saying mechanical models break down hopelessly before the sheer creativity of the brain. 
the mechanistic model and the other model of the brain. But look, the mechanistic model is not, again, univocal. I mean, the question, I mean, what we call, I mean, what we can conceive of as conceivable mechanistic models covers an enormous, I mean, take the point that um, Dan made earlier about the difference between plants and animals. I mean, for a long time, our philosophical colleagues were arguing about the conceivability of a thinking machine or a machine having feelings and so on. All the time they took it for granted that computers had to be anchored down to the floor. Now, a computer anchored down to the floor is like a plant. I mean, there are all kinds of, there are all kinds of skills which, it, which, A, are useless to it, and, B, we wouldn't know whether to say that they had it or not. Mm. I mean, if you had a computer which, which was able to drive itself around and we, and, and we came into the lab one day and found, and found a message on the, on the table saying, gone fishing, you know, then, uh, you know, then we could, you know, then, then, then our attitude towards the computer would change very much, and we might... Uh, uh, if it's said gone to the baseball game, then even Steve might be. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably take two seats or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, so, but I, mean, I think, I think the, I think the, uh, I'm sure what Dan was saying was that down the road somewhere, we shall get to the point at which we shall know how to specify what a computer would have to be able to do in order, in order for us to be able to say, um, it's lost consciousness, for instance, or it's recovered consciousness, or whatever it is, and that doesn't seem to me to be a very outrageous thing to say. Mechanism. Like you, you said before, he's yeah. just going yeah. about Dan. He's mm -hmm. just going to keep people in the business of trying to reconcile our everyday understanding with an out-of-date view on physics. Well, um, to the extent that That's an interesting uh, <laughs> uh, screwball. Yes. Um, I this was again said in other, said in a, said in another context. I mean, I uh, you 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 was I mean, what I was wanting to get at is the sense I have that that Oliver and Dan were not contradicting one another. That what Oliver was underlining was the fact that the sorts of computer modeling we have available to us in detail at the moment aren't yet within several miles of being yeah, able to yeah. do what Dan says one of these days we'll be, we would be able to do if we were prepared to send real billions uh, on it. Uh, well, well. I, I, I'm not sure that I, that I am saying or thinking that, but I think that you know, terms like mechanism and mechanical and computer and computational have to be sort of, um, you know, maybe redefined. And the... Uh, um, I mean, and perhaps long before we get to consciousness, uh, maybe when one needs to talk about emotion uh, and feelings. Um, um, for example, the, um, uh, when uh, J.Z. Young uh, gave his lectures, which were later published as A Model of the Brain, which was based on his work with, with octopuses, um, on the one hand, he, uh, he has circuit diagrams and feedback and talks about the brain as a computer, but then he's too much of a, uh, of a biophile and too much uh, um, um, uh, not to feel the... Uh, he talks about the movement and uh, motive and emotion in an octopus and therefore uh, and says one must... Uh, that the octopus is an exploratory computer. Now, is the word exploratory in a, in a radically different domain from computer? Is this a zeugma? Is, mm -hmm. um, uh, is, is, is one muddling the whole thing? Um, <laughs> does one first need to say, what is exploration? What does it mean to be in the world and sample the world and, um, and construct a world and adapt to the world? Let's, um, and um, I think there's a danger in bringing in a sort of a mechanical model, whether it's Leibniz's mill, you know, his mill of perceptions, which would grind perceptions or computers. I think there's a danger of bringing in the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, our latest sort of technological device too, too early. Well, this is just it. The, the concept of, I mean, the term mechanical, the term mechanism, and the term computer have connotations which are actually much narrower but also more powerful than technically the terms ought to have. When we think of a computer, we think, as, as uh, Stephen says, of a boxy thing sitting on the, on, on the floor or else a boxy thing sitting um, on your desk. But we, we don't really think of, of, a, of, a, of a leaping, galloping robot well, 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 type well, 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 device. Perhaps one, perhaps one shouldn't. And, and when one thinks of mechanism, I mean, 
If, if I say, you know, we already have a good mechanical theory of fire, one may suddenly start on like mechanical, mechanical, but in the relevant sense, yes, the theory we have of fire is mechanical. Yeah, now, one might say, who point, would have the, ever the, thought we could give point. a mechanical the, explanation the, I mean, of fire? The word, the, the, the word mechanical is just a, yeah, is yes. just a ruddy, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's a yeah. concertina word, and this is the trouble. I mean, mm. Le Leibniz, if Leibniz had seen my Macintosh, he would have said, that is not a machine at all. Or he would certainly have said, right, he would certainly yeah. say, quite right, he would certainly have said, quite rightly, that's not what I call a machine at all. And, it's a monad, and but it's got a window. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but, but, no, but, but the point, the point I'm making being, of course, that, every, that everybody, in the, everybody who was doing 17th century mathematical mm -hmm. mechanics was, mm -hmm. you know, was doing this subject to some very constricting exactly. presuppositions, sure. which have gradually been eroded with the progress sure. of physics, just still responding to the way in which the question was in this. Mm -hmm. initially posed because I mean I think if all you ask is does it make sense to talk does it make sense to talk of producing a machine or a computer which is capable of, mm -hmm. of, of manifesting consciousness well you know that, then the question is can we stretch the sense of the word machine can we stretch the sense of the word computer in such well, a way take, that well, 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 take well, an easier well, case well, then well, take the case well, of self-replication because because there is a notion of mechanism which is not the old uh, uh, too narrow notion. There is a notion of mechanism in which at least orthodoxy today would say they've got a pretty good handle on uh, the machinery of, of reproduction, on the machinery of, of DNA and RNA and so forth. There's still, still lots of things to be done. But enough so that they, uh, with, with some exceptions, uh, but by and large they don't suppose that they're going to have to switch to some sort of field theory in order to, in order to explain um, heritability. Um, and of course, if we look at von Neumann, we see that one of his other great, great uh, insights was his paper on self-replicating machines. And he described in some detail what the necessary and sufficient conditions for a self-replicating machine would be. And it turns out to have been a prescient abstract description of the very process that one discovers in, in DNA and RNA. Now, now, there's an enlarged and uh, I think up to the date, up to, up to the minute uh, uh, version of mechanism. What I'm claiming but is... But you really prefer the word machine to the word process. I mean, I noticed you oh, used the no. word process just now. Which well, is, uh, well um, maybe, that's a, maybe that's a stylistic foible that I should try to stifle in myself because I don't mind driving home the point that, that my claim, for better or for worse, is that we don't have to have any more revolutionary science than we have already for explaining replication in order to explain consciousness. That is, that is the, the, the biology and the micro... Uh, uh, biology and the, and the organic chemistry uh, that will explain growth and self-repair and replication will also explain perception and memory and learning and intelligence. Why do why you have to keep using the word machine? It's so anthropocentric. Only people make machines. I mean, why can't... Um, why do we have to it's, it's, it's focus? One, it's one of the well. reasons is the, the, the computer metaphor is not only a metaphor, that it <coughs> eliminates the middle man. No, I think, that, I think that's, that's, that's that it's more than a metaphor as the heart yeah. is a pump or yeah. the, the brain is a telephone switchboard. Is that what you are? Well, um, uh, I just want to disagree uh, with Rupert that uh, the only machines are, are man-made. I think that uh, uh, the right way to think of biology is as a sort of reverse engineering. Um, learning about all these amazing artifacts that have been created uh, by this long process of design and redesign and redesign, and that uh, really all of biology is, as a science, much more closely related to engineering than it is, say, to physics. And that uh, it, it, is, it is reverse engineering, it is, it is always asking a why question, why is this piece like this? Why isn't it like this instead? How does this thing work? And uh, so I, I would want to... Uh, take the benefits and accept the costs of saying that organisms are machines. Well, it's a very conventional view to take, of course. Well, well, uh, most curious. biologists would agree. It's very curious the way that, in many ways, physics has moved on beyond narrowly mechanical views, and biology's got more into them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very curious paradox that biology's got into this very 
deep into this mechanistic mire, I would think it. I think of it as mm. thinking in these rather unhelpful mechanical metaphors. They're helpful up to a point, but I think it's good to remember they're only models and they're limited models and that we may find out things more, we may get more illuminating views of things without um, forcing everything into this Oliver, model. Yeah. Um, the, no, I, I mean, of course you can, if you want, expand the word machine until it means the same as organism. Um, but, um, uh, I mean, to be more specific, um, I think that, by and large, the, um, at least in its uh, higher functions, if you want, the, the brain is non-algorithmic and categorizes everything from the start in relation to self, or rather some sort of self emerges through the categorizations. And this would be peculiar behavior for any any sort of any sort of machine. Well, most computers are non-algorithmic at some level. Your standard chess playing computer is non-algorithmic. It doesn't have an algorithm for checkmate. It takes chances. It's a heuristic program. Uh, uh, it'll beat me every time, uh, but it doesn't have an algorithm for beating me. Um, it just has an algorithm for playing legal chess. But I think what Oliver's saying it's not it's so much the algorithm yes, issue um, as the it's because what what struck me about what you said was the relationship to self it's right. the Meaning. it's the creation there may mm. be mechanical properties but that what an organism does is with respect to, to the itself. personal yes. contingency of its own ontogeny mm -hmm. and that's what makes it at least non-generalizable if you wish to call it a machine sorry i didn't uh, just, no, I, 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 I also want to bring in bring in the word meaning meaning somehow um, and uh, I, it may be that a number of performances which are felt as meaningful, like, for example, playing chess, can be um, simulated uh, using a, uh, a set of rules or, or some other heuristic device which is, which is not meaningful. Um, but I, you know, that a computer can, can beat a grandmaster at chess doesn't doesn't mean it's working the same way. Certainly. And my my feeling would be that they they're working entirely different ways. Now that, that that's a rather complex example, but but uh, I think we we need to think about the some of the differences. One of the things about one of the things about the Cartesian view of rationality is that rationality becomes almost entirely computational. And this is one of the reasons why people are unhappy, I think, to talk about, mm. uh, about computers having all these emotions and the rest, because uh, this involves uh, the philosophical error of thinking that having an emotion is just ha having a mastery of a certain kind of computation, um, and which we don't want to be the case. And uh, th therefore, the, I mean, the interesting thing about the problem of what would it be to design a robot which could really behave in a, in a way which ensured its own survival in a hostile environment mm. is, that it, is that you would have to give it all kinds of You'd have to give skills. it emotions. You'd, you'd well, have not to give it, it yes, and you'd fear have to, and despair. And you'd and have to make it a reason. And you can. Hmm? And, and you, you can. can, yes. In fact, uh, I've been uh, working on a, on a project to do, to, just to describe the specifications of an emotional robot. There's several people in, in artificial intelligence who've been working on this. And in fact, I'll, I'll go even further. I have a, a, a an imagined uh, uh, thought experiment of creating uh, an emotional word processor. Now you ask yourself, how in the world could you ever make an emotional word processor? Um, first of all, you would have to, to uh, deliberately degrade its performance in ways that would make it um, uh, uh, barely uh, suitable unless very, very carefully operated uh, for human use. Uh, what makes word processors nice now is that they just Obviously, don't care. You can't. You can't. Uh, you can't overload them. You can't. You can't uh, put them near their limits. So I imagine a word processor which say lives on keystrokes. If it doesn't get keystrokes, um, it's going to die. Um, you just build it this way, and um, it has memory limitations and so forth that mean that there are certain states of affairs in its world which are threatening to it. And I, I'm going to make this quite real. I, I, um, 
people are going to throw these away if they don't work anymore. So, so uh, uh, it's as it were in its interest uh, to survive that it that it that it find a way of living in this world. And uh, uh, well, I'll try to cut cut all the details short and say I I imagine it would be possible to create such a word processor and give it. I'm not going to let it talk, by the way. I'm not going to let it communicate verbally with its users. You I am going to say, use me, use me. No, use no, me. but it can, it can maybe flash the screen or, or make a little beep or something like that. It's going to have some ways of, of, of reacting. Give it to, do, to two groups of, of users, or give it to users, and, and I think you ought to be able to tune it so that there's basically two ways that users will treat these things. One is considerate. They will come to appreciate the needs of this thing and to treat it well, and it, they'll get rewarded for this. The other way is to sort of beat the tar out of it, the way some people treat their their horses uh, or, their children. or their children. And 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 this will be in effect a, 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 a word processor always on the edge of despair, always on the edge of, of death, but m making a living. And I, I would predict that if you do this right, that if one of the nasty users uh, then came and used the word processor of one of those who was considerate to his word processor, this would very much upset this person. Say, you mustn't, you mustn't treat it that way. This is this is a, this is unconscionable. Can't you see that this is this is this is an improper? This is an abuse of this of this system. Now now. This, of course, is just a thought experiment at this point, but I think that the, the, the sympathies and the reactions that are so important to us when we think of emotions would be evocable and not as an illusion. I think that it would actually be getting at something which is fundamental to emotion, that, the, that, that emotional reactions in us would be evoked when we saw the circumstances that these, well, these systems were putting. Musical yeah. instruments and many things. The point is with the word processes notice and behave differently. Well, um, s certainly, uh, 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 musicians would cringe to see a, you know, a violin, say, being abused or a piano being abused. Um, but I'm supposing that there's really a different dimension because there's, there's interaction of a different sort in these cases. Um, uh, because I'm supposing that these devices are homeostatic. That is, they have ways of adjusting their own behavior in order to, to protect themselves from the things that, that can hurt them in their environment. They actually, they actually live in an environment. That's why I chose a word processor, because it was putting it in a real, not simulated context, where these things actually would have to, to earn a living in a world where people had other purposes. I, I wonder, uh, Oliver, um, you, you uh, asked me, uh, does Daniel Dennett have children? Does he have a dog? Do you remember? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, <laughs> Do you remember why you asked? Um, oh, right. The, um, no, um, um, I think Sherrington asked this of, of Descartes, uh, and when when uh, and when, when when Sherrington worked with his decerebrate dogs, he called them Cartesian trigger puppets. But I um, I confess I I was thinking. Actually, I was thinking of dogs for a while and sort of wishing we would change the subject from these, um, from these sort of factitious word processors to, to real, real, dogs. real yes. animals, yes. real creatures, <laughs> yep. and, um, and, and all think together somewhat about the, uh, um, the lives and adaptations and growth and, and emotions and capacities and, and perhaps consciousness of... Of, uh, of, of animals. Um, but does anybody at this table truly believe that dogs don't have feelings? I mean, as opposed to have theoretical reasons for, th for feeling that they have to say dogs don't have feelings. I mean, feelings, certainly they feel pain, they, they well, can feel discomfort of all sorts. Uh, but of course, feelings, unfortunately, oh, all right, has, well, I mean, has you a... Fed, I mean, you don't, uh, if you ask whether you can hurt a dog's feelings, or can it, uh, can a dog I'm not so sure about that as I am that you can hurt a dog. Would you think that dogs don't experience joy, shame, uh, curiosity, and the, you know, the basic sort of seven odd mm. uh, repertory of um, emotions that uh, people working on the psychology of the emotions argue are in some way or other? 
types of them. You asked if I think dogs experience them. They certainly manifest them. They certainly are instances of them. But to say that they experience them is actually to I say something you, on top of that. that. I, 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 I mean, if, if you're going to use the word experience in a sophisticated way, so that yeah. only one who can speak about what he is experiencing no, 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 can you, you be you said have to have the experience. You don't experience to experience. No. No. Now, manifest no. is the important thing. So when Darwin wrote his book, remember he called sure. it expression. Well, let's go a bit lower. Um, uh, what about, what, about uh, what it is like to be a herring? To be a herring. Living on death. They're past feeling. Incidentally, one one is curious how one has to make these categorical judgments. At first, I looked at this and I thought it was some hideous, shining, slimy, sort of putrefied meat. And then I saw it was a fresh herring, which I, <laughs> which I adore. And, and I immediately changed from, from revulsion to you know, and horror and, and bewilderment. You know, it's some strange joke that you played on us by television. <laughs> um, Gee, I hope you're right. Um, a, um, I, I was mentioning to, to Stephen earlier, a, f a friend of mine has adopted a giant African snail as a, as a pet. But I cannot imagine... Uh, what sort of relationship he has to it. And, uh, and it has eyes. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. You can imagine, I, th I think. Yes, but uh, malacologists have a tendency to dislike ashitinids, the giant African snails. They're some of the world's most horrid agricultural pests and have been responsible mainly through misguided attempts to control them for the extinction of hundreds of indigenous land snails throughout the world. So we don't like those particular ones. But, but, but what about its, its, its homologies in terms of emotion and... Uh, no, no, I'm and sorry, I mean, I was temporizing to get beyond the difficult point. You see, I don't think it's really definable because there is truly a continuum. It is indeed the homology of uh, that perceived similar expression that draws us to mammals and I think where we stop along now it's not the latter which doesn't exist it's where we stop along the genealogical connectivity mm. some people probably look in a fish's eyes and see sufficient homology the same organs are there uh, I don't uh, and people probably differ on that we view all sorts of animals whose actual activities may be quite unpleasant in our terms because they have short faces and big eyes and evoke the features of babyhood that are appealing to us. I think it's fundamentally aesthetic based on both evolutionary distance and certain features of our evolved biology. And that also gets into the question of consciousness, which to me is a very troubling one that we're just on, on the verge of. Because to me it's largely semantic. And I don't know how else to... I mean, of course animals that are close enough to us because of the homology of similar emotional expression have features that in some legitimate vernacular senses of the word consciousness must be conscious. And yet the gap between what we can do with our ability to reflect self-consciously and abstract is so much greater than what they can do that to talk despite that continuity about a meaningful gap is quite reasonable. And we see the differences in cognitive rules which in some instances almost make us cringe in birds for example there are so many learning rules which lead to behaviors that are horrendous in terms of human moral systems so many birds for example only make judgments as to which of their young and which they protect by the simple rule of whether they're in or out of the nest if you take the youngster and put it outside the nest and it horrendously shrieks and appeals or so we read it the mother ignores it and it dies if it's inside the nest, it'll be fed. And of course, that whole system is then subverted by other birds. The famous story of the cuckoo, who, if the egg mimicry is overcome, will force, will for, first of all, not only throw out of the nest the true children of the parents, but then cause the parents to feed it, down to the extent of sometimes the cuckoo being 10 or 20 times heavier in weight than the parents that are feeding it. And yet the parent is still operating by the cognitive rule, feed what's inside the nest, don't feed what's outside the nest. As I said once in one of my essays, it's, it's like the old joke about how you treat a not particularly intelligent uh, guy who's never been to sea and suddenly finds himself in the Navy. And it was it, you only had to follow one rule. If it moves, salute it. If it doesn't move, paint it. <laughs> That's a simple cognitive, cognitive rule. <laughs>
<laughs> it's just a different mental system that yeah. they're following. But there's mentality there. There are rules. There. Yeah, sure. yeah. But if Daniel Dennett is saying, <clears throat> there's not a little man in our heads, uh, that is all powerful. There are a bunch of little men in our heads that are partly powerful, and you can break them down and break them down until you finally have dumb, stupid ants running around. And then, well, you can replace the whole thing by a machine. In principle, yes. Yes. That's, that's the claim. I want to go back to this Why should you want to make that vision claim? Of. I can't understand it. And why Simply do you need any little men? Yeah. Well, well, why do you want to reduce it all to a machine? Why should this metaphor be so hypnotically attractive? Uh, and yes, why, why do you have I, a dog? Why? Um, <laughs> I have had dogs, in fact, yes. Right now, right now I'm dogless. Yes, uh, but I, uh, uh, I'm also a, 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 a father and grandfather. What was his name? Uh, one was Charlie and one was Duffy. Yes, um, uh, the, uh, the homunculi is uh, merely an, a, a heuristic bridge, an explanatory principle. Uh, uh, for many, many years, uh, um, uh, psychologists in particular had learned to scoff at a theory which had a homunculus, because manifestly you weren't explaining anything. If, if you had a theory of vision which said, which was really a theory of television, which said there was a screen <laughs> somewhere in the head which was watched by an inner homunculus, you clearly had simply postponed the whole problem. Mm -hmm. So people got the idea that homunculus theories were bad. What they were missing was another option, which is if you can break the problem down so that you have a team of homunculi and each one does less than the whole job, then you actually can make progress. And then if you can take those homunculi in turn and break them down. Here I'm using homunculi in, a, in an abstract sense. Uh, it's, a, it's simply a bit of machinery which can be treated as, as, as having a certain sort of intelligence and being able to, to do certain, perform certain tasks. And so the, the idea of this cascade, this discharging of homunculi, you ask, why do I want to reduce it down in the end? Because that's the only way that you, you discharge this otherwise offensive metaphor of the inner homunculus. If, if you can, the if you can discharge the, the homunculi, then you're home. The, the, natural word for you, machine, yes. um, the natural word for you to use at this point, it seems to be the verb, the, 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 the noun which your verbs demand, is, not the, is, is the word agent. And what you're saying... Agent is, is good. No, yeah, agent, okay. agent well, is fine. But, but that's very... But, I mean, yes. but the word machine and the word agent are not, in colloquial usage, interchangeable. Oh, no, but the point is... To, I mean, you, is break, to, you, break, you break the overall agency down into, into smaller sub-agencies. And if but that's finally what you're saying, you get down to agencies which are, which are no bigger than a neuron. And, and uh, then the right. question is, is a neuron a machine? <coughs> Uh, it can be replaced by a machine, I think. But the replacement of a single large task by a lot of subtasks, each of which is mediated by a particular sub-agent, this, this, this from the outside looks like a very different program from the one that you were presenting us with at the beginning. And so to this extent, I do think, you know, what colloquial word you choose to adopt to expound your point of view um, is, is terribly important, and you may end up by saying things that are deeply misleading to people in ways that you <coughs> do like, or in ways that you don't well, like. Well, you, you, you see this as a, as a sort of needless provocation on my part, and I see it rather as, as a sort of antiseptic that's required to keep people from positing what I call wonder tissue. Um, one sees in the neurosciences in particular every now and then uh, uh, large sort of theoretical projects, and at one point or another, they postulate a little wonder tissue to uh, to, to get them over the embarrassment. They don't. They, they they know roughly what sort of job has to be done. You need Jack Eccles. Or... Yes. Whoa, yes, but not just Jack Eccles. No. I'm talking about apparently card-carrying materialists who nevertheless, <laughs> who nevertheless. Uh, 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 permit themselves to postulate uh, wonder tissue at one place or another in their theory. And they don't know what they're talking about, and they don't apparently mind. Oh, I and I think, <laughs> that, I think that, that insisting, uh, you know, the prohibition of the postulation of wonder tissue is, is really what I'm getting at when oh, I great. use a term like machine. Well, it may be in a similar sense that, um, that Gerald Edelman talks about spooks. Um, which, which also must, mustn't be permitted. Um, and um, he gets particularly worried about um, 
uh, quantal theories of, of consciousness, mm -hmm. which somehow um, omit all the real tissue of the, of the nervous system and maybe, maybe replace it with, with wonder tissue. Um, the, um, now, I, I think one has to, again, hold tight to the real tissue of the nervous system. Now, certainly, um, decomposition, one way or another, uh, occurs in all sorts of activities which are seemingly seamless. I mean, perhaps um, mm -hmm. in a naive way, in an introspection, would say the world is, is given to us. Uh, you've shown very nicely that we um, that there's all sorts of detail which is not given. Now, one can show very easily that um, colour and movement and uh, uh, shape, um, and, shape and, 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 and other modalities are separately constructed. Uh, and nothing is more illuminating in this way than certain clinical conditions which specifically knock out one of these. One can have a specific motion blindness, which is yes. quite extraordinary yes. in such cases. Someone may see a car clearly until it moves off, and then it vanishes. Uh, and instead there's a, uh, a, a series of, of stills. Mm -hmm. Now, there are 30-odd visual centers in uh, at latest count in the brain, 32. Um, there does not seem to be any master area on which all of these converge. So then, then there's a problem of composition or coherence or binding. Um, how, how is all brought together? And uh, in the absence of any convergence. Now, Edelman again would see this uh, in terms of what he calls re-entrant signaling, a very massive, um, a massive sort of intercourse in parallel and within each centre, between each centre, so that um, so that the final visual construction, and one probably ought to avoid a word like image, the final visual mm -hmm. construction uh, is a process of negotiation and 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 incessantly made. Um, here, then, there's there's no homunculus, but but, um, uh, but 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 somehow somehow there may appear to be, I will say appear. There may appear to be only a what, and not a who. And uh, so that um, one might say, well, yes, you know, I have these thirty-two areas which are communicating, but there's me. You know, where do Over I come, and above those, yes, um, that's um, the mistake. Uh, where do I come into this? Mm. And, um, and the an answer, roughly, uh, would be that these 32 areas and their connectivity and their communication are yours from the start. Mm -hmm. And they bear the impress of your experience and your unique place in the world and your values from the start. So in this sense, sure. um, uh, consciousness is a... Uh, the first sensory consciousness, perceptual consciousness, is, um, is a synthesis into a scene, not of causally or physically related objects or events, but of objects and events which are related in terms of your experience and your values. So your consciousness is yours from the start. In a sense, But there is also the thinner, the thinner sense still. There's, there's a lovely story about Maurice Cohen at, 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 at CCNY. Uh, a student in his class one day put his hand up and said, Professor Cohen, Professor Cohen, how do I know that I exist? And Boris Cohen instantly came back, and who is asking? <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, there, there, yes. there is that kind of possession in which, as it, you who's, as it is you mm. who are the subject of all this, I mean, oh. that, question, that question at least, least is settled. I mean, what the nature of the... Possession, possession relation is that we can go into. Suddenly um, remember, and, and, and Dan, you asking, can we become immortal? You gave the answer, yes. The idea that the self or the soul is really just an abstraction strikes many people as simply a negative idea, a denial rather than anything positive, but in fact it has a lot going for it, including a somewhat more robustly conceived version of potential immortality than anything to be found in the traditional ideas of the soul. Uh, because what we really are is the information contained in our brains, abstractions. 
follows from that marvelously that you and I could be immortal. You said to me, wonderful, thank you. This is scientifically respectable. Um, I think so because the alternative is not scientifically respectable if you understand the implications right. Um, the alternative is that there is, uh, that of all the media of information that there are, there's one which is not, you might say, fungible, that can't be changed, that, that above and beyond the competence that that medium has to, to store or, or transmit or, 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 or uh, operate on information, there's something else that's special about it. Now, um, uh, I think everybody here would agree that in principle, there could be, say, uh, uh, an artificial ear, uh, not made out of organic materials, but if, as long as it reproduce the receptivity, the sensitivity, as long as, it, as the same information channels were there, uh, a, a, a deaf person could, could be provided with an artificial ear, and uh, so long as the, the, uh, the more central areas had not atrophied or something, they would, they would have been given uh, prosthetic hearing. And uh, the, the idea that we could replace any little bit, except one, that there's one area in the brain where the self resides, and it's not replaceable, is, I, th I think, uh, 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 a mystical idea, and I think it's a, simply a vestige of, of earlier bad ideas. Uh, the, uh, in fact, I think Oliver but, just now was giving expression uh, uh, to the idea that what you are is the sum total of your attitudes, your memories, your, your, your reactions, your, your hates and fears and hopes, and all of that could, in principle, be preserved, transmitted, uh, re-embodied in some other medium, and you would go right on living. This is, it's it's uh, uh, a cliché, of course, of science fiction, and it's uh, really remarkable. There's some people, they read about teleportation, they read about uh, the idea of, of a... Of a, of a of a mind being, uh, as it were, recorded and stored and then later re-embodied. And they have no trouble at all with this. They think, yes, of course, that's a nice implication. Other people just find this an utterly intolerable idea. I, I, I'm fascinated to see what these who find that intolerable uh, would put in its place. Um, the, um, no, I do think that we are if you want, the sum of the processes and activities in us. But I also think these are um, not only uniquely marked by our experiences and values, but uniquely coded. And I therefore think that it would be uh, difficult or impossible to um, uh, to transfer the information to to another brain or download it to a machine. It Difficult is a, or a, impossible, a, a, yes. A, it is not information in that sense. Mm. It is a, uh, a unique organization of of incredible complexity. Uh, I which, agree uh, entirely. Which, with um, that. which which um, but I thought uh, which which sort of dies with you. Uh, I agree entirely that we're talking about the most. Uh, rarefied of possibilities and principle because the information that we're talking about is of such a complexity and, and so intricately interwoven uh, the skills with the fears, with the habits, with the hopes, with the memories, with the loves, with the sense of one's own body that for all practical purposes we're not going to do uh, mind transplants by simply uh, 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 booting up some new software in some other brain. Obviously, that's impossible. But, but the question is whether the impossibility of that is a monumental, practical, technical impossibility or whether it's a possibility in principle. I'm saying it is a monumental, technical impossibility, not an impossibility in principle. Well, I don't know how anybody can possibly know. It is, but I, I, I like to come back to this question of wonder tissue. I mean, the fact is, in physics, of course, they're dealing with wonder tissue all the time, because ordinary matter behaves in very counterintuitive ways when you look at it carefully. It's not at all like 
elect electronic computers. And it probably does things that are of some use to the organism. We, we, it would be strange, in a way, if our central nervous systems didn't, in fact, make some use of these very strange properties of matter. In that sense, I think it's not unreasonable that quantum mechanics has something to do with it. It is, it is uh, not, not that anybody yet has a, a model for a quantum mechanical neuron. What about but, healing and self-repair? Would you think that it would be unlikely that, that healing and self-repair could be explained without, without uh, uh, bodies making some use of the more startling properties at the quantum level? Oh, I don't think that would be difficult at all. Just what You don't think what would be difficult? Healing and self-repair. I mean, that's, a, that's an entirely, I, think, I would think, mm -hmm. a much, much more uh, mechanical in the old-fashioned sense process. I wonder. I mean, it's a it's a uh, it's a non-trivial. Uh, of course, not. Uh, in biology, biology, yeah. everything is non-trivial. But, but why do you say but, that wounding and repair relatively trivial? I would s see that in most circumstances. But if one were talking about neurological tissue, I assume that even though it'd be physical, it comes in each human being. This gets back to one of Oliver's points. So conditioned by. 30 or 40 are old, that person is at the time years of an absolutely personal and irrecoverable history that unless you happen to have mapped every last atom of it before the injury, you never could recover it. You might implant new tissue that would allow the person to hear again if it was hearing, but how, you could never recover the person, surely. Well, I, I don't, uh, I mean, you, you may very well be right. I don't know anything about the, the process of sort of neurological repair. It, uh, well, what Prigozhin has written about is this classical myth of predictability. Um, you, when you saw the, the, the sleeping disease patients, the post-encephalic patients, you wrote that, that all these certainties of predictability and having things under control was fleeing away from you, was escaping from you. What, what happened at that very um, moment? Because that's what we're talking about now. Um, well, I've been thinking we, we may need to talk about certain, about criticality, um, critical moments yes. uh, uh, for the individual and the organism and possibly for the phylogenetically as well. Um, critical moments when, um, uh, when sort of infinite sensitivities appear what happened with my, my awakenings patients was that at first one would see a rather nice, predictable, linear, dose-related response. And then something would happen. They would get past a particular point and then perhaps fluctuations would occur, deepening oscillations, and uh, which no longer <coughs> had any uh, clear relation to the time or dose. And sometimes one would see other... Um, other phenomena appear which tended to multiply more and more. And so what you saw was a sort of incontinent complexification. Mm. Um, now, um, sometimes the, the extreme susceptibility and, and perhaps a, um, an infinitesimal increment or decrement of dose could change the picture or some infinitesimal environmental circumstance. Uh, now, at one point, in fact, in awakenings, I was puzzled by this enormous sort of sensitivity, um, my own sort of personal association was, was um, some experiments with liquid helium I'd once seen. And this partly moved me to use the term macroquantal. And I also thought of sudden organization, reorganizations and, uh, in magnetic domains and so forth. Now, I, I was sort of... Um, uh, ignorant, I think, and, and also at that time in 69, sort of, sort of chaos theory hadn't, hadn't been invented. I'm inclined to think that most of the, these situations were, in fact, what Prigogine would call far from equilibrium situations, and that one was sort of seeing, seeing chaotic processes at, at work. Um, chaotic processes which could sometimes get, I think, strangely, interestingly reorganized. Prigogine talks about order through fluctuation. Um, and they were, and they were, they were irreversible. Now, I, um, 
I saw some rather pretty pictures in the Scientific American recently, which were sort of computer simulations of, of cacti and plants growing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and I think not... Uh, I think these things probably follow genetic determination fairly closely. Uh, this isn't the case uh, with the development of the nervous system and the, and the neural tube, where where 50% or whatever of the neurons die or migrate. Um, and so that um, even in identical twins, you end up with brains which in their microcircuitry are quite different. Um, and the circuitry of the brain does not look like any, um, like any man-made machine. It looks sort of much more like a, like a jungle. Mm. Um, this sort of um, circuitry would be incompatible with, with, with sort of, I think, with, perhaps with programming in, in the ordinary sense. In the ordinary sense, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and sort of, and since you spoke of engineers, it would be an engineering nightmare. Uh. Unless there is a quite different, radically different sort of engineering mm -hmm. um, in which variation is of the essence and not, mm -hmm. and not an aberration. And that's just what's coming along. And a lot of funny evolutionary cobbling that might not make Yes, I mean, but I mean, uh, you, you, there's a, uh, a new movement, uh, the artificial life movement, and precisely what distinguishes AL from AI, or one of the key features, is this different attitude toward engineering, whereas in AI, traditionally, and, and we've already spoken about this, takes, starts at the top, describes a problem, and then try to, to decompose it and decompose it and decompose it into its, into its functional parts. A very bureaucratic idea of, of decomposition. But there are other approaches, both to AI and more particularly in artificial life, which operate just the other way around. They're bottom up. They start with lots of uh, little agent-like things uh, or, or organism-type things, and they let them grow. And they build in a lot of variation. And one of the delightful discoveries of this research method is that a whole new space of designs is opened up to analysis. It's the space of designs where you get something which is profoundly biological and profoundly unartifactual, and that is designs with, where multiple functionality is built in everywhere. When human engineers design something, they know that the biggest problem they face is unanticipated side effect. Mother Nature, the process of, of evolution, has no foresight, so doesn't have to worry about unforeseen <laughs> side effects and as a result gets the benefit of unforeseen serendipity where you get serendipitous side effects that are good so you get multiple functionality. The nervous system looks like a tangled jungle, it looks like an engineer's nightmare and indeed it is just about impenetrable to analysis by traditional engineering methods. However, it does not appear to be so impenetrable to these new methods which are working from the bottom up and are beginning to grow very interesting structures which look much more biological and have some nice properties. Scarcely surprising in a sense since it is a biologically evolved structure. Evolutionary biologists of which I'm one are of course fond of saying that variation is the only sure. intrinsic reality and that types and means are only the abstractions. But with respect to multiple functionality, Darwin himself was quite clear on this, but it's almost a logical need, although there are plenty of empirical evidence in particular cases. If you don't have multiple functionality, given the massive chances and mass extinctions and climatic shifts and contingencies mm -hmm. of evolution, if you don't have variation in multiple functionalities, you're dead. Yep. The hydrodynamically best designed fish in the world dies when the pond dries up, and the pond always dries up in the fullness of time. Lineages that get through do so either because they have massive redundancies or because for good fortune, structures built for one function through natural selection are co-optable for others. Take the original fish, which has both a lung and a swim bladder. I mean, pardon me, both, both lungs and gills. You know, the only way it can evolve a swim bladder is that it turns the lung into the swim bladder and, and keeps breathing through gills. How could you ever get 
the bones of your inner ear, which are jaw bones in a reptile. That's inconceivable. Creation say it's an inconceivable transition because while the bones are moving from their articulating positions in the reptilian jaw into the mammalian inner ear, you'd have to have an unhinged jaw. But of course you don't. The intermediary forms have a double jaw joint. And once the double jaw joint is established, then the two old bones of the reptilian joint are free to move into the middle ear because functionality is maintained. There's always that massive yeah. redundancy. And what that leads to, of course, is organic machinery that is vastly non-optimal with respect to traditional principles sure. of human design. Um, I, 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 rem I remembered what I, what I forgot, uh, but um, I, I think it's probably another expression of this enormous redundancy or, or degeneracy, as, as, as Edelman calls it, and this is the, the great neural robustness of identity, um, so that you, um, you can have a remarkable amount of brain damage. Uh, either in specific areas or globally, and the person is still there. Or, um, yes, but, but what is the person at that moment if you're lacking a, a complete set of information? Would you say? Um, um, the Nevertheless, it is there a robust identity? What is it? Um, I, I, I want to tell a little story first, which is, uh, which is that when Henry James was in a, a terminal pneumonia delirium with a temperature of 105 degrees and um, it was said that uh, his, the utterances of his delirium were not only Jamesian but they were late James. <laughs> <laughs> Which means they were incomprehensible. Yes. <laughs> uh, of unnecessary semicolon. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but um, one sees with, say, something like, um, say, like, like Alzheimer's disease, that even perhaps when the person has uh, uh, can no longer comprehend or use language when conceptual thinking is much altered, that they may show, uh, um, they may still show sort of musical expression or, or an ability to draw in which, uh, in which their sensibility and their, um, and their idiosyncrasy and their sort of style is, is, is clear. But it's, um, uh, I, um, uh, a colleague of mine, was writing a book on Alzheimer's disease, and I said to her, don't call it the loss of self. In fact, she, when she published the book, she called it the loss of self. But I think that, um, that if self is lost, it's, it's very late indeed. And, well, um, I, I, and this basically, because everything is, is an expression of self. Every gesture, every movement, every word, every thought, um, every predilection. Just in between, may, may I borrow a question from you out your, of your last book, Consciousness Explained? Uh, literally, fun. Fun, yes. Uh, has not yet received careful attention from a philosopher. Yes. We certainly won't have a complete explanation of consciousness until we have accounted for its role in permitting us, and only us, I doubt whether it is true, but to have fun. Mm -hmm. What are the right questions to ask? Well, Stephen J. Gould. Uh, which animals can have fun, Steve? Dogs can have fun. Well, animals. Dogs can have fun. Cats no, can have fun. No, I think it's, it's, uh, because it's because fun. <laughs> it's a hard word. It is. Animals play. Mm -hmm. yes. And play is also a loaded term, but I think there's no doubt that particularly juvenile mammals engage yes. in a lot of purely exploratory behavior. Now, it may be functional in terms of learning. They tend not to do it after they become sexually mature, which I don't know what to call except play. That, that that it is reptiles don't do it. And reptiles don't do I it. Don't, and birds it's a whole don't literature. I'm not sure there's absolutely none, but but oh, if it's not none, it's close to none versus oh. mammals. Occasionally, adult mammals will. There's a wonderful story that Schaller tells in his book on the giant panda. For example, pandas are probably the most boring animals in the world, uh, <laughs> though they are icons because they're so cute. And the main reason for that is they have a carnivorous digestive system, but they eat bamboo. It's hard enough to digest so bamboo anyway, but with a carnivore's digestive system, all they have, so they have to eat it all the time. The way you track a panda, because they defecate continuously because it can't process this stuff, is you just follow trails of feces. So that's basically what pandas do. They, they're very, very dull animals. But Shallow once, once, 
observed a panda slide down a hill on its stomach, on a snow, snowy hill, and then it climbed up to the top of the hill and, and slid again. down again. Yes. <laughs> you, know, yes. you can read that any way you want, but I'm not going to push that too far. But, it's, it's it, but I think it's pretty clear, and there's a very large literature on play in mammals that characteristically yeah. juvenile mammals play. By the way, all these studies of so-called language in, in apes are done on juveniles uh, virtually. Sure, of as soon as chimps become sexually mature, they lose all interest Absolutely. in it. So, in a, pl play is <laughs> exploration. Pl pl play is probably functional. That's how you how you learn yeah. tasks. But I don't know what to call it, if not play. So I think it. I think that's mm. legitimate in the evolutionary mm. literature. But it's interesting. Once we raise the idea of play and also of fun, if we. I mean, I, I've been uh, uh, amused and interested to just ask people more or less point blank, which animal species, aside from human beings, do you think are capable of having fun? Not just of b preferring being alive to being dead, but <laughs> of having fun, being capable of having fun. And uh, pretty well it's restricted to the mammals. Some people think birds can have fun. Some people share my sense that, that, as it were, flight is wasted on the birds. We would have so much fun if we could fly. They <laughs> apparently don't really have fun flying. Uh, People have a lot of intuitions about, about this, and I expect that they also line up maybe even better than any other intuitions with, with their moral sensibilities. I mean, the, the, the worst thing would be to eat an animal that could have fun. Intuitions are very historically bound. Paley, at yes. the end of the Natural Theology, talks about how God has created katydids with their marvelous capacity for this joyous chorusing, which shows that all of nature is involved in endless delight. Mm. Self-delight, not delight for us. So. <laughs> um, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's seen uh, natural history films of, I think, otters mm -hmm. uh, sliding. And, and this is just the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of animals having fun is these otters mm -hmm. scampering up the hill and, and sliding down on their bellies into the water and doing it again. But notice that all we'd have to change is one feature of that and we would have a completely different sense right, of it. fish at the bottom of this No, slide. no, no. <laughs> if we see them trudging up the hill and sliding down, I think our sense would be, this isn't fun, they're deranged in some way. This is some terrible obsession that they've got going here. <laughs> and they're no longer having fun. They're, they are caught in some hypnotic web. It wouldn't be fun. There's something about the uh, uh, excess energy mm -hmm. expenditure that we think is right. essential to its being fun. If they, if they were plodding up the hill... Ski lifts. We, we, we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's why we have ski lifts, so that we can have fun. It wouldn't be fun if we had to herringbone our way up the hills all the time. Yeah, this, uh, this, this may come back also to the notion of, of spontaneity. Uh, I wonder, I wonder uh, Freeman and Rupert are listening, but not saying very much. Yeah. Well, I was why? thinking about baseball. I mean, it is, it, it is probably true that the humans evolved mostly by learning to throw rocks, and, and so baseball may have been very essential. So that seems to, to, to persist in adult life. It's also a wonderful game. For you. <laughs> <laughs> but but you, sa you said it. <laughs> but you were thinking the last two hours about baseball, or no, no, <laughs> just no, dreaming? Just now. Hmm. I have a lot of thoughts about what we were talking about earlier, but not so many about fun. I don't want to go back, necessarily. Well, what is your well, conclusion after all oh, what has been discussed the last two hours, for instance, about consciousness? Well, it's just that the starting with this, uh, starting, and we got into the whole thing about internalization, machine metaphors, breaking down into little bits. And my feeling is, you see, that there's a that we're leaving huge set things out of the puzzle. They may or may not be related to these, uh, the magic tissue or wonder tissue of quantum theory, which I, I liked very much what you said, Freeman, about you know, Dan may not want it in biology, but physicists deal with it all the time. Um, and my own feeling is that there are huge areas we don't understand about human and animal behavior, implying forms of interconnection and um, causal factors, maybe physical principles, that we haven't yet taken on board. And we're, we're just not going to get anywhere solving this like a jigsaw puzzle with several missing pieces. However long we go on, we're not going to solve it. So my approach is to try and find what these areas might be and design experiments where one could find out more about them. 
One area, let me just mention one, in the realm of animal behaviour, namely the homing of pigeons. Now, nobody knows how pigeons do it. And every seemingly reasonable hypothesis has been tested to destruction. Um, we're now in a position where it's just... It, this seems, I think the, the evidence points to the, there being some completely unknown means by which they do it, some form of connection between the pigeon and its home that we haven't taken on board in our model-making about like the evidence behavior. of yeah. magnetic particles in the yes. head? And the... Well, this is what's satisfied. It's a pabulum for the last 20 years, magnetism. For the magnetic particles may exist in the head. The pigeons may be able to measure the dip of the magnetic displacement, you know, you displace them north, the needle may, of the compass and may dip. Can, yeah. Move them due east or due west, the dip's exactly the same. The magnet won't help them in the slightest, even if they've got one. And... How do you know they're working only on dip? This, well, even yeah. if, if they have a compass, if it's a compass... Maybe it's a compass. All right, give, them a, give you a compass, parachute you into some unknown area. You've got your compass, can you get home? I can get close enough to home until I pick up other signals, which is apparently... Can you, without a map? Oh, I have to know where I am relative to oh, where I've been. Of course, that's the that problem. Well, How do I you know where you are relative to home? Because you've migrated there once before. No, I, don't, I, I doubt you just take a pigeon in an airplane and drop a parachute randomly somewhere. But if you're you talking can, about... You can, you oh, can. This really? was done in the Second true? World War, yes. In the Second World War, pigeons were taken routinely on Lancaster bombers. Um, from the, the British um, Royal Air Force Pigeon Corps That's supplied these um, <laughs> pigeons. They were taken on Lancaster bombers. And the, the idea was if they were ditched in the North Sea on the way back from a sortie in Germany, uh, then the, the navigator had released the map reference. They put tie it onto the pigeons let, and let it go in case radio contact was broken. Thousands of lives were saved by these pigeons. Some were released in the middle of the night in freezing fog, 100 miles from land and they got home. The, the really outstanding ones were awarded medals, and the <laughs> record of these can be found in an amazing book called Pigeons in Two World Wars by Colonel Osman. And um, the, the meritorious performance list has about 500 examples of astonishing feats. They were literally dropped out of planes in the middle of the night, sometimes in the middle of the winter, in freezing fog, and they got home the next morning, and lives were Suppose saved. Suppose that you had a very simple strategy that you flip a coin and you either s uh, fly due west or due east until you hit land. And, and uh, so half of them then will, 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 will come, uh, would come west and would, would, would ar arrive at England and the other half would arrive in the Netherlands. You have to record the ones that don't make it, which these But they, yes. the point is, they do. They, 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 first of all, they observe the vanishing the direction. They the point is the ones that make it get the medals and the other ones you forget about. <laughs> But in experiments, there's been hundreds of experiments done, you see. Every one of these ideas has been tested by serious researchers over long periods. And cloudy days, you know, they've been released on cloudy days. They've been released with their time clock shifted six hours or 12 hours by keeping them in artificially displaced day lengths for weeks. All these pigeons can home. They can home with magnets strapped on their wings or with Helmholtz co coils over their heads. Um, with the blindfolds on? Uh, yes, co frosted glass contact lenses. They've been released up to 200 miles away and they flop down within a quarter of a mile of the loft. Many of them uh, mm -hmm. uh, collide with telegraph poles near the loft, but they, most of them get home to the home regions. And I have a pigeon loft in Britain. And the, the key experiment, you see, all these theories, you know, they see landmarks, the frosted glass contact lenses rule it out, the cloudy days, the time shift, the magnets on their wings, the, Every one of these seemingly reasonably remember the way out on the, ho on, on the journey. That's been tested with pigeons anaesthetized, taken in rotating drums by incredibly devious routes. <laughs> when they come round, you release them, they fly straight home. Well, all these theories have been tested. There's been years of Olfactory, research. Is there, is there... Yes, they've had their nostrils blocked up with wax. They get home. <laughs> they've had uh, <laughs> confusing poor, poor smells animal. like turpentine put on their beaks. They get home. Oh, and just in case that doesn't work, they've had their olfactory nerves severed. Anosmic pigeons. Those get home. If they, uh, some don't fly at all, because but if you use then to overcome the idea of non-specific trauma. 
They've had xylocaine sprayed on their nasal mucosa, a local anaesthetic. Those pigeons home straight off with no delay. All the, it's a fascinating literature. For 30, 50 years, 100 years, Charles Darwin suggested the idea in his paper in Nature in 1873 on the origin of instincts, that they remember the way out. And that was the first theory to be tested. Every seemingly rational theory has been tested and tested and tested. And we've now reached a point where all of these have failed. We're in the realm of epicycles now. People are saying, oh, well, it's not any one of these in particular, but knock out two or three, and the others somehow take over in an unspecified combination. Now, my experiment is designed to test this theory to see, I think there's an unknown factor involved. I don't know what it is, but I think the pigeons are somehow linked to their home. So whereas all previous experiments involve moving uh, the pigeons from their home, my experiment involves moving the home from the pigeons. Hence, I have a mobile pigeon loft. And so you can train pigeons to move to a mobile loft. It was done in the First World War with uh, the British Pigeon Corps. It had mobile lofts behind the front line. There's another thing Colonel Osmond's book enlightens one about. They were converted London buses. Um, <laughs> the Japanese had them in the Second World War. I have a fascinating book uh, about the Japanese pigeon corps in the Second World War, showing wonderfully Japanese mobile loft somewhere in Manchuria with sort of pointy ends to it. <laughs> Oriental <laughs> pigeon loft. <laughs> um, and <coughs> pigeons are cultures <coughs> distinct. <pigeons. laughs> But if you move a pigeon, if you move their home, the first time you do it, you can move it just 100 yards, and the pigeons are totally confused. They're, even though they can see the loft, they fly around the place where it was for several hours before a brave one goes in, just as we would if we went home and found our home had moved 100 yards down the street, we wouldn't just I'd open the door. Walk in yes. Under any circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> but after a Not while, <laughs> after you've done this three or four times, you can get them to home. Now, I've <laughs> trained these pigeons up to the point where they can, the loft can be moved four or five miles, and you, you go back, you take them out, put them in a box, you tow the loft away, you go back to the first point, you open the box, release the pigeons, drive back to see when they arrive, and they're sitting on the roof. Well, so far, there's no mystery. This is an area where they could do it by sure. perfectly normal means, fly up in the air, see it. The crucial experiment, I'm so sorry to say, I haven't yet done, because the person I did it with who feeds them and has contracted a disease called pigeon lung, which means he can't go in the pigeon loft anymore. It's like asbestosis. And so I'm sorry to say this is an unended uh, saga, but here is a perfectly reasonable experiment. I think the chances of it working are only about one in ten, because I think you may need to move more of the home than just the loft, even though I leave half yeah. the pigeons in it. But a mobile island, a floating island, or a ship would give one the capacity for moving more of the home. It's an area open, potentially open to empirical testing. The budget for this experiment so far has been 500 pounds. Not very much. This is a poor man's sport, and, and so one doesn't need big grants for this kind of work. Here is a real mystery, and you'll find people who'll tell you it, it isn't a mystery, but anyone who actually works in the field and who knows the literature um, and I've gone into this quite recently in quite a lot of depth, and there's, there is, it's completely unsolved. And so we have this pigeon homing, the homing of dogs and cats, the migration of fish, huge tracts of animal behavior, which have big implications for the evolution of migratory pathways, which can evolve quite rapidly and so on. Large areas are unsolved, and these could have a great deal of relevance to the understanding of faculties of various kinds that we haven't taken into account. This is one example. I have quite a number of others. <laughs> um, when you say this is a real mystery, do you mean this is a real problem? I mean it's a real problem. A mystery is something we don't understand. I don't think it's something no, no, we no, can't no, no, in no, principle no, no, understand. No, no a, a mystery is something which cannot in principle be understood, whereas a, whereas a problem in principle can be... Oh, well, I think in that well, sense, if you use the word mystery, yeah. I mean a problem. Right. I mean, I wouldn't be doing research on this if I didn't think it could be solved. Yeah. I, I, I mean, um, to the Trinity as a mystery. If you don't mind, I want, I want to end up with signs, uh, but before, um, how has consciousness altered the world? Uh, Steve Toulmin, uh, the more I read of history, the less I'm convinced that the events of the Holocaust were unparalleled. Rupert Sheldrake, you said to me, if you look at the reality of human behavior, then we find brutal massacre and killing of members of our own people. 
is part of what people have done for a long time and the so-called modern civilized world has done more of it than most. Uh, Stephen Gould, uh, they said that Mengele whistled tunes from operas as he decided who would die and who would live. It's incomprehensible, but here it is. Freeman Dyson talking about the Second World War. People in the concentration camp bureaucracy were simply taking orders from above, signing papers, writing contracts, getting all the apparatus to work to exterminate the Jews. Those were the people who were analogous to myself. It's killing by remote control, which is the cause of all this. If I conclude with a question Oliver asked himself, we seem to have astonishingly little idea of what basic human nature is like. Well, if we're talking about consciousness altering the world, what we are doing with it, where it's all about, Steve Kuhl? It almost takes a paleontologist to realize the magnitude of the issue. Think that life's three and a half billion years old, and it's really only the last couple thousand years since we got numerous enough to build cities and establish the technologies that come from home bases and agriculture say 10,000 years, I can't measure that in almost every geological situation. That's a betting plane. It's not even a measurable tiny amount of strata. And to think how much the surface of the earth has been transformed through the mental activity of one species in this geologically unmeasurable moment, it's remarkable. Every time I fly in an airplane, look out the window, there are places like the great western expanses of the United States where you realize we haven't established hegemony over every little square inch, but uh, to fly over the New York to Washington or Boston to Washington megalopolis makes you realize how powerful this is. With respect, though, to the issue of our cruelties, I, I think I, I'm not optimistic. I mean, our cruelty has immense power, but I'm not so sure that the overall record in almost statistical sense is really that bad. I don't want to go on for too long because this could rev me up, but I don't, Homo sapiens is, is a, in fact a very peaceful species as species go. I remember something Ed Wilson once said to me which stuck in my mind. He said that we call a species peaceful if, say, 60 hours of research have been logged on it and only one or two violent acts are noted. He said, but think of human beings. I mean, if you look at most human beings for 60 hours, you don't see any violent acts. You might see a parent cuff a child or speak harshly to someone, but the point is there are thousands of acts of kindness for every act of nastiness in the genetic and behavioral and mostly cultural program of Homo sapiens. The problem is that the acts of kindness go unrecorded. You can have in a community 10 years of work for racial harmony, which includes thousands of meetings and countless thousands of hours, and then there's one random murder across racial lines one day and it's all undone. The point is the newsworthiness of one act of violence overbalances the unrecorded tens of thousands of acts. I think in general, we're quite a Pacific species. And with respect to Hitler and the Holocaust, yeah, I don't, there, there are thousands of Hitlers in human history. The only thing that distinguishes this one is they had a technology that allowed them to do it on such a vast scale. Unfortunately, that technology is now a, a part. That doesn't make things any, I, I don't mean that to be read overly optimistically because you only need one to, to press the button, but I think it is not a statement in, about human nature in general. To, no, I, but I, I mean, I think you've drawn attention to something that's terribly important, which is and which is also, in its way, extremely hopeful, which is that we notice these violent things. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, they stick in our minds. I mean, you, I was saying the things we remember about childhood are the things that almost never happened. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and here, you know, we, we know, this is very important, the fact that we, that we record these things. I mean, for instance, you know, we've been going through this enormous tizzy over something called terrorism. When you look into the record of the Lebanese terrorists, uh, about half of them belong to one family. You know, I mean, the, the Hamadi brothers. I mean, the very fact that we're able to record the fact that a significant proportion of the Lebanese terrorists belong to a single, you know, were, were the brothers in a single family, I think should be appointed to the fact that it's a very limited range of people in, you know, in, in this, these particular communities. I mean, they can do an enormous amount of trouble, uh, but even more, they'll get a reputation for being much more pervasive and much more um, troublesome than they, than they really are. in Lisbon, 
talking about, for instance, Yugoslavia, what's happening there. You said to me, people refuse to learn from each other's mistakes. That is the gloomiest thing I feel at the present stage yes, of well, my I life. Yes, I was feeling that at the time, and I still feel it, of course, in many ways, but, but what's apparent, what becomes more and more apparent, because the, there was a very interesting item on BBC World Service yesterday. Yugoslav would be living in for, for a long time and had a, a Serb and had, a, had a enormous difficulty in getting back to, back to Belgrade. He'd got back to Belgrade. He said, there's a crime wave here in Belgrade now. Why? Because most of the people who were in those Serbian irregular forces were be, who were beating up on, on, on Croatian, Croatia were criminals. Uh, you know, who, who'd got out and who'd been allowed out and who'd been recruited to, to, to engage in all this mayhem. Now their occupation's gone because the war has moved to Bosnia. Now they're back in Belgrade, returning to their usual o o occupations. I mean, one, we really... Uh, I, I mean, we're always told about such hatred between the Serbs and the Croats and the... Uh, I don't think we have the documentation which allows us to know just how widespread this is. There are, again, there are clearly enough extremely beastly people who have set their minds on breaking up the situation to, you know, to break up the situation, but it doesn't well, well, have to well, be... You talk about beastly people, uh, uh, Freeman, you said it's not about beastly people, it's about common, little, ordinary people. Uh, working in, a, for instance, a bureaucracy at the, in the, the Second World well, War. Very, the, 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 yeah. so, the real so, evil is bureaucracy or is bureaucratic. Is no, that, that I was speaking specifically about the, the, the Holocaust. I mean, this, what goes on in Yugoslavia is very different. It is it's much more face-to-face. -face. People actually slaughtering each other face-to-face, -face, which is, of course, an old pastime, but it's, it's quite different. Yes, but think back. What you said, we have broadcast a film uh, just two weeks ago about you and the situation uh, in Bomber Command. Yes, well, that, of course, was a... That was the modern way of doing it, but uh, which is something new when it's done bureaucratically. But what we see in Yugoslavia is the old way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, the most frightening book I think I, I've ever read was Hannah Arendt's book on totalitarianism, especially the last part of that. And I had an odd dissociation when I was reading it. I thought I was reading the history of a hideous species, a hideous alien species. And then um, I suddenly thought, no, this is, this is us. But having said that, um, I can also believe that this is a, a relative rarity and that we may biologically be a fairly peaceful, decent species. Um, when I read someone like Alice Miller on the transmission of neurosis from generation to generation, um, I find there's a sort of a, a sort of dramatic and even melodramatic power in this. Um, but I. I don't think she is talking about the... Uh, I, I think she is generalizing from pathology. I am much more reassured by someone like Winnicott, who talks about good enough uh, mothers, good enough parenting. Um, I think that if we have... Um, mostly, I think if we have good enough parenting, we're OK. Uh, uh, Rupert, I remember you talking about the present order is doomed. If we have an extrapolation of present trends, we have a kind of apocalyptic scenario within 10, 20 years. Well, I think, um, I think, that, I mean, many people think that, and I, I, I think the present order is doomed. I think the, the interesting thing is the degree to which the whole of the Western model, both Jewish and Christian and secular, is based on this apocalyptic scenario, this apocalyptic model of history, uh, with one form or another of um, a, a direction in history coming to a, a replacement of the present order of things with something else. In the communist view, it was the withering away of the state as a kind of utopian or millenarian end to history. Um, in, in uh, the biblical view, it involves catastrophic events of 
destruction, earthquakes, fires, plagues, diseases. Uh, um, and there's a sense in which many of us expect that kind of thing, uh, at least unconsciously, I think. Uh, so the question is, to what extent is it a self-fulfilling prophecy? Well, I think to a large extent myself. I suppose I'm the only survivor from the 30s here. I mean, it was, <laughs> yes. Because growing up in the 30s, I have exactly the opposite yeah. feeling that, that, that the, the future looked totally black. And I didn't expect to survive. Yeah. And, and uh, I didn't expect civilization would survive. It seemed completely hopeless in the 30s. And somehow or other, we, 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 we did survive. And, so ever since I've taken all this doom and gloom r rather lightly. And well, Steve Gould, you said we are doing very badly in moral terms. And that merely illustrates that consciousness didn't arise for reasons of our higher moral development. Uh, our brain gives us the capacity to do all sorts of wonderful and all sorts of terrible things, and we do them all. Mozart as well as Auschwitz. Not uh, a very profound comment, just an well, obvious one. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the end of the 20th century, shouldn't we redefine morality? Well, we're going, to have, After to, the we're going to have to redefine some aspects of morality because I think the, the traditional moralities have, have simply f failed to uh, articulate answers to some of the problems that now face us. The one, the, the, the one that impresses me in this regard. Uh, if there's one principle of morality which is so obvious it's so trivial, everybody accepts it, it's, it's the rule that philosophers say of ought implies can. If you're unable to do something, you can't be obliged to do it. It can't be your fault if it was simply outside your power that you didn't do X or Y or Z. Now, what's happened though, and really just in this century, is that human can, human competence has, has exploded. We're now capable of taking action in spheres where before we just couldn't. I mean, uh, uh, diseases were uncurable, uh, uh, famine was unstoppable. Uh, there were, we just were relatively impotent before. Now we have suddenly tremendous access to power and we don't know what to do because we suddenly have new obligations that we never had before. And what you see is people uh, casting about sort of frantically, even desperately, to find some way of choosing among all the moral possibilities that are now open to us. I mean, right now, we could all decide to be pouring our energy into Amnesty International or Oxfam or making everybody vegetarians or, or stopping abortion or stopping capital punishment or feeding the uh, uh, people in Somalia. There's, there's thousands of claims on our moral attention mm. and we cannot respond to them all and nobody has told us <coughs> what the principles are of how we filter them out and how we decide which things we're going to do. So what happens is you get people who become sort of moral specialists and who decide they're going to put their energy into one issue. They're going to be a one issue person. And I sympathize tremendously with, with that move because it at least gets you going, it gets you off the hook, it's, it, it removes you from a situation of paralysis. But I don't think that ethical theories, I don't think that the great systems of morality have yet even begun to address that problem, and I think it, it, it really oppresses us all in a way. But again, I think this idea that ethics should be a matter of great theories is another 17th century yeah. heresy. I mean, yes. if you, you know, if you, if you, if you go back before, uh, I mean, to, uh, the, in, the, in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle's perfectly clear that eth ethics isn't basically a matter of theory. Mm. And, mm. And, and although I sympathize and would echo very much a lot of what you say about how the present circumstances and our present powers mean that we have to rethink a whole lot of, you know, of the application of our basic moral perceptions and intuitions. It doesn't seem to me that, you know, that the basic moral perceptions and intuitions are all that different. It's that the circumstances in which, yes. in, to, in which we have to Indeed. appeal to them Indeed. and think about them, yeah. these are what are unprecedented. We're oppressed with a new power and new knowledge. Um, I include, including mm -hmm. the power of standardization mm -hmm. and, and routinization 
And, uh, and since, as we were talking earlier, the essential thing about being human or being an animal is being individual, I think, uh, I think one of the first threats is... Um, well, the, the, um, uh, the, the, um, Dickens was already very eloquent about this in, in hard times when, yes. um, when you were merely one of the hands. But do you, do you all seriously think that individuality was ever pervasively celebrated, particularly in our much more class-based society? Did Peter the Great care when he had his hecatomb of 20,000 people beating, building St. Petersburg? Did the generals of the past care when they lined up their soldiers in serried formations to to march forward? No, I, I think that kind of individuality is the particular concern of artists and intellectuals and, and should be, and it's in part that society is much more egalitarian, one of its few decent trends that we see it as a pervasively greater problem these days. I'm really glad to hear Stephen say that I've always somehow had a Philistine attitude myself towards morality, I suppose, in a funny sense, and that maybe it is just a few homilies and precepts and not, well, and not theory, systems. Cate kind of yeah, categorical imperatives <laughs> have a much appeal to me yeah, because good. God help us if we have the wrong one and kill him. It's like, I like hypothetical imperatives, messy things, golden rules, a few things like Maxims, that. Maxims. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I think, think theory has to be justified no, I know as a form I'm, of practice. I, yes, well, uh, it yeah, isn't that no, practice no, no, has no, to no. answer before no, no, the high court. No, I mean, in philosophy, in philosophy I, have all, uh, I have all this trouble with people who think that the solution is going to be to find a theory of practice, you know, for me, this, theory, yes, right. yeah, for, yeah, for me, this, for me, this, theory of practice. yeah, preferably, <laughs> preferably, <laughs> exactly. And, and yes. For me, for, for me, what's much more important is to get back to the stage at which you realise that appeals to theory are another form of practice, you know, and, yeah. and then, yeah. and then to see when they're appropriate, when they're inappropriate, you know, and and so on and so on. I mean, this is all. It was a rather intellectual, superficial thing I had in mind. Though, on the other hand, I, you. Well, one can certainly take it in a kind of Quaker sense and say that, that the doctrine doesn't matter so long as the, you know, we have enough to deal with on a practical level that uh, we shouldn't be distracting ourselves too much by racing off after doctrines which don't have, which don't have any relevance to, to, to these, all these monstrous things we have to do, mm. of which we had that list. Rupert. Well, I think that the, the, it's quite clear that our problems have a lot to do with the way we think, and I don't think it's possible to change what we do without changing the way we think. And the problem is that nobody really has an alternative model at the moment. We, we, a lot of people realise this is ecologically disastrous, this way of going on. It's, uh, it solves certain social problems but creates others. Um, the Greens have probably the most radical critique of this, but they don't really have a viable alternative. So I think it's awfully hard to know what to do at the moment because we don't hardly know what to think about this complex of problems. So I think in order to... So inertion? No, I think we have to look for things to do. There are certain pretty obvious things to do. You know, more recycling, less consumption and so on. Um, but the idea that we can sit down and plan these changes is becoming less and less plausible as the whole system cracks up. And we in Britain are seeing the very rapid decline of a whole system of government and a whole system of an economy happening far faster than most would ever have imagined possible. Um, and the trouble is that when the, all these tr traditional bureaucratic instruments and government uh, uh, institutions begin to crumble, there's nothing really to take their place at the moment. So no one quite knows what to do. I think that seems to me the big problem. We don't have a model for a post-industrial world order. Better a bad ideology than no ideology. Well, I think so. What I mean, what what happens is you get a. I mean, all the ideologies are now discredited, aren't they? I mean, the the the, if the social. Only, if only. <laughs> it seems to me that the really serious problem, the one that we have to m make progress on before we can find a new ecological world order, we have to figure out what to do about those societies on this planet that have no sense of uh, the, the free exchange of ideas that are, that are rooted in fanaticisms of one sort or another, or just of, of dogmatisms which are traditional and honored and respected, but which make the rational 
discussion that we are all just taking for granted around this table make it impossible. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, for me, I think that's the first problem we have to deal with, and I don't see any way of dealing with it that isn't, um, to some degree, upsetting. There's no way that you can deal with this that doesn't uh, upset, shock, hurt some people. Uh, but it has to be dealt with. Otherwise, you're left in either just grotesquely imposing a solution that we in our rationalistic world figure out on these other people, or uh, simply caving in and letting, uh, and, and in, in a way which I think is, is even worse sort of paternalism, letting them proceed with, with, uh, with an ideology which we ourselves think is, is bankrupt. Uh, and, and just sort of tolerating it, and, and it's, it's a hard that's problem. Why, that's why I, I was impressed by this, you know, I think what Rupert is describing is indeed the withering away of the state, but, I mean, not exactly as Marx had it in mind, but that action will become, effective action will become increasingly local and increasingly non-governmental. You know, that's why, to come back, I think the non-governmental organizations are in some ways ex express the conscience of humanity and point, you know, point directions for us that governmental organizations have become discredited for. Yeah. Tolstoy is um, fascinating because it's clear that they, in the world of morality, the world of moral relations uh, was limited by the distance that you could walk or at most ride a horse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you, the world of moral relations was the world of the relations you had with the people that you were in daily touch with. They were the only people to whom you seriously had uh, mor uh, uh, moral obligations who had cl who'd had claims on you and the rest. I mean, per perhaps perhaps we've been too kind of we've we've developed the habit of thinking that that unless we can solve a problem globally, the pro problem isn't worth solving. And you know, we know we are in a better position to discover what is morally adaptive to the, situ to the detailed circumstances of the situations in which we, in fact, find ourselves. And, and what, if, what if Freeman succeeds in his fondest dream and uh, uh, establishes communication with, with a civilization on another, on another uh, planet and, what, and discovers that the message they're sending us is a, is a heart-rending plea for help, together with some uh, uh, suggestions about how we might actually help them? Suddenly, our moral obligation sphere will 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 grow again. Uh, have you have you considered uh, whether you want to take on that? Oh that yes, chance? I think this would do us a hell of a lot of good. But uh, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> take our but mind off our, our earthly problems. Yes. yes. No, it's always uh, easier yeah. to, to be charitable to people who are far away. But but to <laughs> <laughs> no, I, when I visit the, the when I visit the United Kingdom these days, I don't see a. a disintegrating culture, I've been, as far as I see on the local level, things to seem, seem to, to, exactly. to go rather well. And I don't, I, 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 I'm, of if course. Anything, if anything, is rather boringly the same. It's somewhat, at least, I mean, it's certainly disintegrating much more slowly than America. Oh, I don't know, it depends where you live. <laughs> Daniel, uh, Albert Camus. The myth of Sisyphus, yes. 1942, in yes. the middle of the war. Uh, could you quote it so that the viewers will hear it and then explain why it's the first quote you use in your book, Consciousness Explained? I didn't know your eyes were so bad, you need Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to be sure. Yeah. And here are trees, and I know their gnarled surface, water, and I feel its taste. These scents of grass and stars at night, certain evenings when the heart relaxes. How shall I negate this world whose power and strength I feel? Yet all the knowledge on earth will give me nothing to assure me that this world is mine. You describe it to me and you teach me to classify it. You enumerate its laws and in my thirst for knowledge I admit that they are true. You take apart its mechanism and my hope increases. What need had I of so many efforts? The soft lines of these hills and the hand of evening on this troubled heart teach me much more. I quoted that because I set that, self, that as a challenge to myself in the book. I thought it very eloquently captured what, what many people think of when they think of human consciousness. And it captures an attitude, uh, particularly where, where he says, uh, uh, 
you describe it to me, you teach me to classify it, you enumerate its laws. And in my thirst for knowledge, I admit that they are true. And, but then he goes on in effect to say, but that's, well, there's something else, there's something else, there's something you're missing if that's all you do. Well, I wanted to acknowledge that challenge and then meet it head on and say, well, if you do it right, see if we can capture everything without residue. See if we can uh, do justice to what Camus has said here about consciousness. Uh, uh, if we don't, then we've, indeed we've left something out. Uh, we've, uh, we've, we've left something uh, still very much in, well, no. We may have left some things in need of explanation. There may be other things that Camus is suggesting don't need to be explained. Uh, it's not so much that we can't explain them, is that the very idea that they are candidates for, the, for requiring explanation is just a mistake. <clears throat> it seems to me there's been a, a wave of anti-scientific and anti-rational books in, in England and mm. elsewhere recently um, which um, see science as, um, as a great spoiler of human life and perception. Uh, perhaps this is your point, Dan, yes. and, and in a way sort of say that the, the, um, the poetic outline of the hill is, is threatened by any theory of hill formation or whatever. Exactly. There's a rather nice um, uh, example given, uh, which I think is given by either by, by Helmholtz in his, in his auto, in the little autobiography he wrote towards the end of his life, or maybe in some account I read, of how he was with some friends in the Alps and a storm blew up. And um, this fascinated him, and, and, and Helmholtz immediately pulled out paper and pencil and started making some calculations and, um, uh, and looking for a theory of, of storm genesis. And one of his friends said, you know, doesn't this spoil your appreciation of nature? And he said, no, it heightens it. Yeah. Um, I, um, and, um, uh, and sort of the more one... I said before, it's, 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 uh, Mozart seems to come from heaven, but I think, I think the more, um, although one can enjoy Mozart infinitely as a naive listener, being a sophisticated listener, it's, it's even better. And if you knew how Mozart's brain created it, that uh, would be better still. It would make it, would um, make it even more wonderful. Um, and sometimes, uh, sometimes they're not even as complex when you figure it out. Mm -hmm. I remember finally studying Handel and realizing yeah, yeah. how he gets the most amazing effects with the simplest things. Yeah. I used to think they were more complex, but even yeah, that's yeah. enlightening. Yeah, sure. Sorry, I'll hold on. No, uh, I don't think, um, in this sense, science or explanation or reason uh, need be felt as a threat to anyone or by anyone. Um, the if mystery has a place, it will it will keep it. Um, I can never quote exactly. Um, somewhere in the four quartets, um, Eliot says, um, "You are not here to inform curiosity or bear report, or you know, but to kneel and pray where prayer has been valid, or something like that." Actually, I confess that line annoys me because it was in fact. Um, I always want to inform curiosity and bear report, even at the very moment that I may want to kneel. Mm, mm -hmm. uh, and it seems to me that sort of, sort of, sort of respect for the, for the unfathomable whole, plus an active investigation of, of some of the mechanisms, are, are, are not incompatible. Uh, Freeman, yes. I'll try to get you into the discussion. You said that the idea that we are anywhere close to any sort of uh, ultimate understanding of things is a kind of illusion of grandeur which I don't like. And if it should turn out that the whole of physical reality can be described by a finite set of equations, um, I would be disappointed. I would feel that the creator had been lacking in imagination. Uh, does everybody agree on that? That there is no end to theorizing? Or in certain fields of science, there is an end to theorizing and others? We are evolving continually. Well, we are exploring, first of all, before we even theorize. Mm -hmm. 
How do you explore before you theorize? Well, you just go out and see what's there. But, I mean, that no was... categories. That was uh, in the old days, but nowadays... No, we're still doing, we're still doing that. No, I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's where the way a lot of science still is. I mean, not all, by any means. Yeah, but all the tools that you describe, we have to make these new tools, but, the, but we can't use the tools without having a theory about why they're good tools, can we? Well, some, uh, some theories, of course, are tools, but... but uh, but there's so much we don't understand. But, I mean, I, I, I think it's... Uh, the great mystery is, if, in fact, that we do as well as we do, considering we only just came down from the trees. Mm -hmm. um, I, I got a little worried by, um, by Stephen, uh, by Hawking's book, which, um, which I think was partly about the notion of, of the exhaustibility of science and whether one can have a, a GUT and a theory of everything and whether we'll, we'll have it all buttoned up in, in 50 years or so. Um, I, um, I think I partly picked up some of this attitude when I was at CERN, when they said, well, you know, we've simulated the universe down to sort of 10 to the minus 30 seconds of the Big Bang and, you know, and Another, another 30 years and, and we will have got it. Um, I don't think that... Um, uh, I like to think that every solution will reveal a wider horizon and a range of problems one may not even have thought of. Um, I'm sure that's the case in in psychology, in neuropsychology. I, I'm less sure in physics, but, but you're, you're yeah, well, the person to nobody, meditate on nobody, that. Nobody can, can be sure of anything, but uh, no, I find, I mean, I, I have enormous respect for Stephen Hawking, but I think he's, he, he, he doesn't know the difference between a model and the real thing, I mean, you know, mm. <laughs> and that, that, uh, that's a, a, an occupational disease of, of theoretical physicists. <laughs> and, and any of the natural history sciences, anyway, the details are, are, all right, melodies may not be formally inexhaustible, but for all conceivable practical purposes, there's enough, uh, enough numbers, enough exponents after the 10 I write that I'm not going to worry about. And I feel the same way about natural mm -hmm. history. There may be certain theoretical corners that will be adequately resolved, but there are always going to be so many organisms out there with interesting patterns. I, I don't have the slightest fear that we'll ever get close enough to ever worry about completion. Well, I just came from three days of hard science and a, 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 a conference in which all the experts from all over the world gathered together in one room in the field of gamma ray astronomy. And it's just exactly like paleontology. We're, we, are, we are looking at the past and we're seeing marvelous things that we don't understand at all. And it is mostly case histories. We had three days of fantastic case histories. And I, I enjoy this tremendously. And it had, I think, uh, it has something to say. It, even in the hardest of science, theories don't, don't, don't actually help a great deal. That, that they, um, the world is much stranger than we imagined. Well, this is a starting point. You're stopping, but the world is stranger than we imagined. Yeah, I mean, like, the, like the universe is? Uh, yeah, even in very hard parts of science, which this is, we're not even close to understanding what's going on. Even in quite easy parts of physics, I mean, the problem, we know what makes gases gaseous, and we know what makes solids solid, but we're still quite rocky on the question of what makes liquid liquid. Right. You know, so, I mean, I think it's very important that people understand that, that the things that we don't understand include some of the most elementary and everyday things. In fact, particularly those. If you look at almost anything that's plainly obvious in, 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 and, and look at it in detail, you find we don't understand it. The people at CERN are in the position of a horse wearing blinkers and, and only being able to see a very small patch of the road in front of him. They're, they're, they're constrained by their machines to look at very, very narrow questions. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Luria was very fond of quoting something of Lenin's, uh, um, although in general I think he was not a Leninist, um, but, uh, but the maxim being that mm. science is the ascent to the concrete. <laughs> and this is a very interesting and paradoxical yes, yes. thing. And, um, you know, and perhaps um, some of the, you know, we are saying now that in a, in a, in a sense we need a science of, of individuality, a science which, which allows us to comprehend how each creature, and in particular each human creature, sort of makes its own path. I am um, I'm fascinated and by the... Um, by Nagel's essay on 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 on, um, uh, on on what it is like to be a bat. Um, you seem doubtful whether that was a, a sort of a, a legitimate concern of, of science. Of, 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 no, of, um, of, of on the Nagel's contrary, um, uh, uh, I think that science can address these issues. Uh, and is addressing the issues. Uh, and in fact, there's a sort of illusion of subtraction that's going on mm -hmm. where, where people say, well, well, you've, you've got that little bit, but there's always this residue you haven't gotten. You get a bit more and say, well, you got that, but there's still... And, and they keep uh, uh, inflating the importance of the residue because it's all they've got left is the residue. And they should instead relax and, and, and uh, not view this as, a, as some sort of marginal line which science will not cross. I think that's just a very fruitless way of thinking about it. I mean, yes. science is extremely low in public esteem now. I mean, science funds are cut year after year right. by the government. Right. The scientific community is extremely demoralized. The swing against science in the schools is huge. No one wants to be a scientist. That's terrible. Can't get a job. You're held in low esteem. Um, and in any case, it's seen as responsible for pollution, nuclear disasters, and so forth. So there's a very, very negative image. And, um, there's a, no doubt many reasons for this, but I think one of them is the habit of not so much of research scientists, who are often quite modest about what's not known in their area, but of scientific popularizers of the triumphalist kind. You know, so this is nothing but this. You know, the, the human being's nothing but a machine, and the nothing butter is. Um, have, have <laughs> sickened a lot of people, including myself, I must say. Well, who, are the and, who are they? You're not going to seriously link the decline of, sci of science in Britain to a few uh, journalistic meliorists, are you? It's a much deeper and more problematic Well, I think, I think that the, the public alienation from science is, is, is partly the feeling it takes away the, the mystery of life, the value of life, and that kind of thing. Partly the sense it has disastrous consequences. Partly the feeling that it's alienated us from nature and is responsible for the ecological catastrophe. There's a whole series of reasons which um, are related to that. Um, anyway, it throws science, at least in Britain, into a kind of crisis. And um, the future of science is rather unclear, at least in our, our country. When I took forward a dawning peels Fields, flock, Flood. and lonely tree. Oh, you yeah. hardy, yeah. but uh, all seem to gaze at me. That's you hardy talk. Yes, yes, that's that's like hardy. Like chest and children sit silent in a school. Oh, you've memorized. Upon them stirs in living's mere, as yeah. if once clear and cold, but now scarlet <laughs> red at all. We wonder, ever wonder, why we find us here. Can you remember why you quoted him? Yes, because that's one of Hardy's many poems in which he argues that academic scientific knowledge of the gain of the 19th century has taken away that sense of wonder that we once had. I think that's a misconstruction. There's a very common perception of what the Darwinian revolution had done. I remember doing an article on the paintings of Frederick Church, America's mm -hmm. greatest mid-19th century landscape painter, for whom the notion that he was painting God's illuminating and harmonious landscape was vital and he had a real there were other reasons part of which was he become very successful and, and was wealthy but but one of the main reasons why I stopped painting after 1860 was that he, no longer could he see his beloved landscapes like that again in the Hardy poem which you just quoted which is of course later he conjures up this image of uh, the beasts and the plants saying well we used to know what the meaning of our lives was and its harmonious order but now Darwin has come along and we wonder ever wonder why we find them here, but I, I really think that's a misconstruction. That was a false 
psychological hope that was deep in Western culture. I think Darwin's answer was the correct one. Darwin's basic answer was, you quoted it earlier, nature, if invested improperly with moral properties and therefore seen as the source mm. of our answers for solace is not going to return very good answers to us because nature appears either amoral or misplaced in our terms is sometimes at least a rather ugly spot. But the correct answer is that the source of morality is not to be found in the factual products of nature, which after all we're here for billions of years before we ever emerge, so why should they be constituted to provide answers to us and that the source of moral instruction is within us, which I think is an optimistic answer. Uh, Freeman, do you remember uh, the end of the 30s? Uh, threatening plagues all over Europe. Yes. You should be dead within a few years. Yes. And then there is this wonderful book of mathematics about mathematicians. You're reading it, escaping vulgarity, brutality. Do you, do you remember yourself, memories are, well, falsifications, we know, reconstructions, we know. But do you remember yourself reading about mathematicians and fleeing into this world of abstract beauty? Oh, very clearly. And of course, uh, this, this book, Men of Mathematics, mm. apart from being male chauvinist, it is, uh, uh, it's full of the same message because the people he was talking about, the people he was writing about, were themselves living through horrible times, especially the, 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 there were these... Uh, Descartes, of course, was a soldier and took part in a lot of bloody... Uh, operations, and many of the heroes of that book were people who were involved in wars and, and had, had found in mathematics an escape. Poncelet or...? Yeah, Poncelet was a good case, who was in, imprisoned in Russia after the, the Napoleon retreated. Of course, that was a very strong message. What are the first books everybody can remember? Uh, Moon Man and Otto, or... Uh, oh, lucky to be a Yankee by Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> <laughs> no, books, books, books. Dan, do you remember f the first book that's coming to your mind, ever say the first book you have been reading? Or the most important book? Well, I'm, I'm sure this is not the most important book, and I probably am recalling it now, almost certainly I'm recalling it now, because I recall it just a, a week or two ago. A book that I loved in my childhood was a book called Paddle to the Sea, which had these wonderful drawings in it. And it was about a, an Indian boy who made a little um, birch bark canoe. I mean, he just carved it out of wood and he painted, painted it all up and there's a little Indian paddling it. And on the bottom he put a little brass plate and he said, uh, if you find me, put me back in the, in the uh, water, I'm on my way to the sea. And the, he was up at the end of Lake Superior and, it, and we traced this, this boat which gets blown by the wind and so forth and goes through the Great Lakes and eventually gets out to the St. Lawrence Seaway. And uh, it was just something wonderfully, uh, uh, the, the, the illustrations were brilliant and the story which completely captured my imagination as, as a, a sort of wonderful quest and, and an exploration of, of uh, uh, geography and uh, how water works, I suppose. And, uh, uh, it didn't turn me into either a, a, a geologist or a marine biologist or a, uh, it turned me into a canoe paddler, though. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver, any specific book you're remembering? Um, I loved, I loved the Just So stories. I, I, I think I must have been so in, the, in the Jungle Book. Um, my uh, my middle name is Wolf, and uh, I think there was uh, some part of me which 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 liked to identify with the with with the Wolf Boy. Um, uh, somehow this was seen as a um, a sort of as, as, as cleaner and better and nicer than, than than being human. Though of course one of the coming back to language and consciousness, one of the things. Which Kipling does is to endow all the animals with, with language, yes. and so he has it both ways. But um, yeah, I, th I think probably the Jungle Book. The jungle Book. Did they speak to each other, the animals? Oh, oh, they oh do. Yes. Oh, yes, in the book, yes. but in your yes. fantasy. 
Um, yes. Those pictures first formed in consciousness are the most important are, as you know. Right. Um, no, I, and um, I found it sort of difficult and disillusioning to, to, um, to realize that animals didn't speak to one another. Hmm. Um, I think I think another very early book, which many things were read to me. My mother was fond of reading to me. Was was um, was Flatland? That strange book of Abbott. Yeah, Abbott's yeah, I didn't discover that till college. <laughs> yes, <laughs> me either. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When I say, do you remember your mother's voice reading to you? I sometimes I can either reproduce it. It, it, it either comes back to me totally. Oh, I can't remember it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't quite reconstruct it. Uh, Stephen, you were... Uh... No, I was remembering my mother's voice. Yes, I can yes. remember it. <laughs> what kind of a voice was it when she was reading to you? Or wasn't she reading to you Good, strong New York accent, just like me. <laughs> Warm, loving, and comforting. <laughs> Not very dramatic. <laughs> like in the but... books. <laughs> The books, you know, the little engine that could. Uh, lucky to be a Yankee. I, I, I spent my childhood on New York streets playing stickball. <laughs> I mean, this notion that all adult intellectuals somehow had uh, glasses and played chess when they were five was really not right. Yeah. So, if I say the first books, first books I read played an important role were, in your life. Well, no, I, I mean, I, I didn't mean to be facetious, but Lucky to be a Yankee, which is the story of a man, Joe DiMaggio, a great American baseball player who was and still is my hero. It actually is a fairly inspirational story. I think baseball is as, as good a phenomenon as anyone else, but the story of a man driven absolutely maniacally to excellence of whatever the chosen profession, the little engine that could, the, the story, story of the, it's the same story, <laughs> isn't it? They may be a little overly heroic, but they are inspirational. <laughs> okay, Rupert, you are the youngest here, the Benjamin, uh, 49. Uh, well, well I, I was, um, I suppose two things come to mind. One is, there's a, in England, there still exist a series of stories called Rupert Bear. <laughs> and Rupert Bear is a, is a little bear who has all sorts of adventures. And he, he goes underground into caves, he flies through the air. I recognize these as shamanic themes, and it's full of talking animals, of course. And uh, I love those books, and I read them to my own children now. So I've recently started getting a new dose of Rupert Bear. Um, because, uh, I suppose partly because being called Rupert, I identified so strongly with the central character. The other one I remember that really made a big impact was when my father was an amateur naturalist. And he gave me, a, quite early in life, a, a copy of Fabre's book of insects. And these stories of these different insects and what they do and their habits mm -hmm. gave me a, a tremendous interest. I mean, these alien worlds of these scarab beetles that, and, and spiders and so on. Fascinating stories of, of, of insects. And each one was an entirely different world. It's the what I mean. It's the natural historical mm -hmm. particularity. The greatest writer ever on insects. Yes. Yeah, so I read these. I don't know what age I was, six or seven or something. I was really into insects, and I used to keep caterpillars and raise moths and so forth. The the first book to make an extraordinary impact on me was not uh, was nothing alas to do with cricket. It had to do. It was Greek mythology told to the children and. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, in particular, Theseus and the Minotaur. I mean, the image of Ariadne and Ariadne's thread is, you know, was became deeply embedded in me. And so the, the, the task of, so to say, finding one's way back down Ariadne's, down Ariadne's thread is, is, is something which has really stayed with me and, and I think played a large part in the fact that, for me, all these intellectual inquiries come back and cluster around the question of how you know, how much one can re how much one can recreate and rediscover about the things that have always seemed important I've heard uh, beautiful answers beautiful questions the last couple of months from all of you uh, the most beautiful question I can think of is one that you raised in one of your books um, why does a bamboo flower every, what is it, 120 years? Yes, and how does it count the years passing? <laughs> Please, uh, Stephen. 
would you get the answer? Because no, I don't know the answer. It, Is it exactly 120? Uh, there are different species have different cycles. There was this one that uh, did it every hundred something years. Nobody knows how they counted because they flower that those species flower simultaneously. Are they prime numbers the world. Like, like the cicadas? Well, that's that's of course that's what the essay was about. Yes. I don't think when you get up to 120, you don't have to worry about being a prime number. It's so long that nobody <laughs> yes. else can track you. The cicada, yeah, yeah, 13 yeah. and 17 year story, does seem to hold yes. mm -hmm. as uh, as an explanation. There is a reasonable evolutionary story one can tell about the why you The answer is boring. Like the that, question that, is beautiful. Do you agree? Oh, I see. Well, I. I thought okay. the answer was more interesting than the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, well there's, the there's, there's at least yeah. this one wants to know, because there's basically there's two ways of counting. There's analog and digital. And if it's digital, then they're not ever going to make a mistake. They're going to be right on the... They're not going to get 119 or 121. There's not going to be any yeah. spread, because by the time you've got that far out, um, uh, 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 error is going to accumulate. So on the other hand, it, it may be that there's some way in which it, error is, is doesn't accumulate. That's an interesting question. Do we know the you, we don't know the answer to that question, Not I guess. Not the bamboo. As far as I know, the cicada flower, the cicada brooding cycles, which have been traced for at least a couple hundred years, are precise. Little question: How can you sign Spinoza? Oh, oh, you can indeed. Um, w uh, one yes. of the things which um, uh, which fascinated me when I went to Gallaudet, this great university of the, of the deaf, was mm -hmm. to see sort of uh, philosophy and chemistry and, and mathematics lectures and sign. And um, the, but I think that whatever, whatever you can write or speak, you can you can sign. Um, My best experience speaking at Gallaudet was the bimodality of laughter, because the audience was partially hearing, right. and I would get two laughs for each comment I made once when people heard it, and the second time when the signer got to it. Yeah. <laughs> <That> was, <laughs> Good for the ego. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but surely you can say anything because a word that's that's so abstract that doesn't have a sign is spelled out, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, an, uh, any more beautiful questions? I thought of a question that I was asked recently. I'm not sure it's a beautiful question, but it it you know, it fascinated me. Somebody said, um, uh, "Which would you prefer?" Um, to write something that was so right and so clear that everybody thereafter just accepted it, took it for granted, and hence, as a result, in 20 years, nobody would ever bother mentioning your name again because it was just had entered into the culture. Or would you rather be like Kant and write a book which was so obscure that you'd be immortal because it would be studied and studied and studied for centuries? And I think there is a that does does represent a genuine tension in the world that we inhabit, and uh, one has to face the fact that uh, the cost of the first course is, in a certain sense, oblivion, it, an honorable oblivion. But uh, 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 my answer, but only after a little soul searching, was I guess I, I would prefer I would prefer the the former, even though. Uh, 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 Dan, you, you steer it in such a way as you gain an eponym out of it, so it becomes Dan, it's it law, you see. That's <laughs> well, in the, in the, in the science... Which may out to, be to change with time. That's right, yes. Right. That's, that's, that's one of the... That's right. You, you, you hope for that. The philosophers never get that sort of glory, though. Well, what kind of a day was it? This little reunion or... Well, union would be a better word, wouldn't it? It's not a reunion in the sense well, that... Well, it is for you, so but not for... Well, for me, yeah. it's a reunion. Yes. And that's <laughs> the thing, yeah, so. Disappointing, fascinating, illuminating. I, I feel we've only just started. Yeah. Um, and um, so to speak. <laughs> so to speak. Um, but... Uh, but perhaps... Um, but that's, that's a, perhaps a, a feeling one needs to have in life that one has, one has just started. Hmm. Well, I, I, I just came from some very exciting meetings in, in the last four, four days, and, and, the, and I was thinking, first of all, that, that the people there were, very, were mostly young, and, 
and a lot of them were women. This was somehow lacking here. It's true. I, I had a day of reading yesterday when I um, I had a big packet with all of your books, and um, the. Uh, um, and it gave me, uh, amongst other things, uh, you know, a perhaps needed sense that uh, um, I don't too often have the sense of, of, of contemporaries. Maybe, m m maybe none of us does. But I, you know, when I was reading that, and again today, I sort of uh, suddenly got this feeling of us as, as contemporaries and sort of encountering the the end of the twentieth century and in our different ways, though, though obviously all having to, um, and perhaps also all in our different ways with some sense of the, as you said, with the, the end of, of modernity or modernism in sight, and, uh, uh, and some need to reach back sort of, I don't know, before Galileo or before the, to the pre-Socratics or, or whatever. Um, but uh, I think we're probably all, in a sense, solitary people with with solo lives, and so it's, it's been rather rather exciting and unusual. I think having the sense of, of contemporaneity and parallelism. But it's difficult in this situation to to feel as unbuttoned as we all of us presumably did in the solo phase of the operation. I mean, I do think that mm -hmm. yes. it does seem to me that, you know, that, e that each of us was then free to, to range off and ramble after right. anything, whatever, and I inevitably, inevitably there's a certain minimal professional constraint involved in having to say things in front of, mm. in, in front of colleagues who have their own good reasons, quite different from one's own, to... You know, to, 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 to want to leap in and qualify what you've said. <laughs> no, I, I remember at one point, one of us, I forget whom, was about to say bullshit, and then... Never heard that. And, 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 and replaced it by something. <laughs> something which... Anodyne. All right. Yes. 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 And Rupert, disappointed? No, I think it was a very... To have the space and the time, a whole day, abstracted, artificially from the rest of um, one's normal concerns to sit in a room where we just talk all day. This is a, quite a new experience for me. I don't usually sit around a table all day just talking with an endless supply of food and drink. Um, so it's a real symposium in that sense and I, I've, I, I've really enjoyed it. And it's, for me it's a rare experience to have an entire day talking in a leisurely way. So I've, uh, and I've also wanted to meet practically everybody here, those who I hadn't met before and those who I had. That's, I think that's particularly important. Um, uh, everybody here ha has written a book or an article that I have read with fascination and, and, and learned from. And so it's just extremely nice to be, uh, uh, to have the occasion to, uh, to, to converse with these people. Uh, I'm probably the only one who hasn't spoken on this. I, when Wim came and interviewed me, I accused him of being a hopeless romantic. I still would reinforce that accusation. In the sense that I think your hope was that by getting a group of people who are false modesty or reasonably competent or at least noticed in what we do, that somehow if we all got together and talked, the meaning of life or something deep and profound would emerge. I'm not sure it has. But then, that's what conversation is. I'm not even sure that... Uh, I think we have a false impression. It's, it's almost like the analogy I was trying to make between uh, the 10,000 acts of kindness and the one, and the one Hitler. We emphasize the Hitler. In, in a sense, what's great about Joyce and Ulysses and what's... It's not wrong. It's, it's what drama has to be about most drama. Most drama is not real conversation. I mean, real conversation in drama would be inexplicably... Dull. Now you're going to abstract this anyway. My one objection is that this is this is our modern world. This is, it has been a wonderful conversation, but I can't forget that I'm on the TV lights, which bother the hell out of me. And then there is that artificiality, which which I accept because it's of the nature of the deal, so to speak. 
But I just think it's it's been a good conversation. Most parts of most conversations, no matter how interesting the people are, pretty darn dull. And, okay. and tonight, as we lie in our beds, the conversations will get better and better. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing they remembered in retrospect. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a, you know, think of Absolutely. the history of quotation, for example. Almost no major pithy quotation is true. I mean, you all understand that. The great deathbed quotes were never said. The great battlefield quotes were, were never said quite in that way. They're all improved <laughs> later. And it's the same thing. You remember the snippets in a conversation. But any conversation put on the stage in Toto is inexpressibly boring. I think the dullest film in the history of the world, not everybody agrees with some people thought it was a great film, was my dinner with Andre. Why did I have to pay six bucks to watch two people have a conversation over dinner and I didn't even get to eat? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you'll be, you'll. So I, I had a good time. Yes, if only the technology existed so that Vim could uh, record our, our our pillow conversations tonight. That we when we oh no 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 no. no. What I'm afraid yes, of is that we when do, so once we start yeah. eating now, for instance, in a restaurant here in the neighborhood, then the that's real thing will happen. happen. Of yes. No, you're Absolutely. a romantic. There is no. This is the real thing. Well, you, you, did. you said to me there aren't any peak moments. Well, I want to no. ask everybody of you: there aren't any peak no. moments. It, it just endorphin yeah. rushes in your head. That's all there is. Or you're smoking too much marijuana. Well, well then I will ask anybody here: aren't there peak moments that you yes. didn't expect but suddenly arose? And no, I, I, I had one, <coughs> one. Um, Grand evening in, in conversation. It was um, it was uh, five years ago when um, I really met Joel Edelman for the for the first time. Mm -hmm. I had struggled with with um, one of his his impenetrable uh, books, and um, and you know and got a feeling of, of of significance coupled with frustration and bafflement, and you know it. Um, but then we, we found ourselves in, uh, at a conference together in Florence on memory, and after that we had dinner. And um, there, was a, there was a paper tablecloth, as, as there often was, is in Italian restaurants. And um, he got me to sort of telling stories, uh, which I love doing. I'm, I'm basically a sort of a, a storyteller. And some of these stories and experiences he then interpreted in terms of, of his theory. And suddenly um, everything started to make sense or seemed to start to make sense. And I had a feeling um, of, of meaning being given its, its role back in biology and of some... Um, of some sort of mechanical and mechanistic and computational model of the mind, which had uh, frustrated me for years as being being replaced, um, I had the sudden sense of uh, of a possible science of the individual. And when I uh, when I walked back, it um, this is going to sound absurdly romantic, but but there you are. These moments happen. Um, I. Um, uh, the moon was shining over the Arno, and I thought that was very, very beautiful. And I had a great sense of happiness, and I was delighted to be alive, and I thought, I'm glad to have lived as well, to the dawn of this theory. Um, now, I will say that a certain amount of um, disillusion has set in since then. However, that was a, that was a wonderful sort of, sort of evening and most of, the, of my experiences of that kind have been, have been with books, but that was with a real person and over dinner. Well, there is a wonderful chapter of Lewis Thomas when he compares conversation as being a specifically human activity, just as building nests is for the termite. Well, did it? Dinner time? Yes. Thank you all so much for being well, thank here. You. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Well, you're going to have a great time editing this sentence. Oh, wonderful. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> so what's the logistics, boss, especially for people who just came here and haven't been anywhere? Who wants to know that? Is he going back to his hotel? Is he going to go for supper?